Good to go, guys. So welcome, everybody, to this meeting of the Planning Board on Thursday, July 9th. I'm going to walk us through the introductions and the agenda. But first, I should say that this meeting is being taped and broadcast. We also have a uh, member, Brian Furs, participating by, actually by video screen rather than by phone. And this is for reasons of geographical distance. My name is Emily Innes. I'm the chair. And I'll ask the other members to introduce themselves. I'm Alex Whiteside. I'm a member. Michael Kelly, member. William Clark, planning director. I'm Julia Gettner-Mesberg. Uh, Tim Sierwinski, assistant town planner. Cheryl Tagayas, member. And Brian Furs. Brian Furs. <laughs> And I just want to welcome Julia. This is her first planning board meeting with us, and uh, glad you've joined us. Okay. Welcome. Welcome. Yeah. We look forward to working with you. Absolutely. So let's run through the agenda. Our next meeting dates are July 23rd, August 13th, and August 27th. We will have our second zoning public forum on the 28th at the high school at 7 o'clock. Uh, we'll be looking to discuss the approval of past minutes. We'll have citizens speak. There's no new business for tonight. We have three public hearings, 715 for a special permit and site plan approval for Thayer Nursery. This was continued from June 18th. 815 for special permit, site plan approval, and scenic road on 865 Brush Hill Road, continued from June 25th. And at 9 o'clock, we've got a, the discussion of a preliminary subdivision plan for 41 Pleasant Street. Under old business, which we're going to weave throughout these others, we have the process for and discussion of the zoning articles for October 2015 town meeting. So let's start with past minutes. Do we have any past minutes to approve? No, uh, we do not. Okay, fair enough. In that case, we're going to move on to citizens speak. Are there any citizens here who are wanting to speak on any item other than the public hearings that we have in front of us? So if you're here for Thayer, 865 Brush Hill Road or 41 Pleasant Street. We ask that you hold your comments until the public speaking portion. Uh, otherwise, and you're here for something other than those three, please come forward then, introduce yourself, and speak into the microphone. I'm here for that, but I'm also here for another reason. Okay. And that is uh, the master plan. I, I find it and the, and the conversation, particularly about Alex's comments in the Milton Times, to be alarming. And I feel like uh, it's something that all of us in town need to take very seriously. Because I think uh, the planning board looks for a license to uh, loosen zoning restrictions. And I think that's the reason why most of us moved here. And so to uh, loosen those restrictions and to play fast and loose with, with zoning, it seems to me is disconcerting. Alex's comment, which he retracted, but um, I understood, I, he didn't say he didn't say it. Uh, he said, you know, he would have no problem with a big box store on President's Golf Course. You know, even if it was meant to be funny, I'm sure it wasn't funny to the people who live right off Granite Avenue. Um, you know, there are neighborhoods, there are people who have lived there for years. And a funny comment about big box stores uh, on President's Golf Course is not funny to them. And so I, I think that uh, I, I would urge um, residents to um, get a petition together to bring some kind of home rule to their neighborhood or their precinct so that uh, when a, a project, a specific project, is is uh, recommended, let's say, that um, people would have the right to um, take control of their neighborhood and their area. Um, one of the things that I had noted during the uh, master plan meetings, I, I noted on several of the exhibits, was that we lack infrastructure. So, you know, it might be a hypothetical, but uh, putting a big box store on Granite Avenue with the current size of the roads would you would create a huge block. The, the whole idea of getting off of uh, Route 93 and trying to get up Granite Avenue with all the traffic that exists today to a big box store is, is outrageous. I think before any uh, commercial projects can really be considered, we have to look first at infrastructure, and I think we don't have it. So, um, you know, just to protect 
the town that we live in and to uh, keep in mind the reasons why we uh, located here. I think, uh, you know, a, a petition where we introduce the idea of some local control over projects that may be introduced in our areas needs to be, uh, needs to be done. Uh, so I, I, I think, uh, you know, another thing that I constantly noted uh, during the thing was uh, my concern over airplane noise and the, and the, uh, uh, and the impact on property values. And, and I think like the basics, infrastructure, uh, threats to our property values have not sufficiently been taken into consideration. Um, so I, I think it's important for us to look at local control, look at local approval. You know, let's not uh, uh, devastate an area uh, just in the, in the pursuit of additional tax revenues. I think that would be a mistake. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, I, whoa, like whoa, 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 whoa. I, I was in the middle of a sentence, so hold on for a second. Point, point of order is that we didn't get a, a name and address. Oh, I'm That's sorry. All. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <Come forward. laughs> I, had, I had two of you jumping. I, was just, I, was I just wanted thinking. to get that before he ran off. <laughs> Phil Johanning, 23 Parkwood Drive. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. So, just a, a, a quick note. Um, I'm going to recognize Alex. Thank you for the point of order. Uh, the master plan doesn't actually recommend a big box store in that area, and I'll, I'll let Alex speak to that because I think he was going to. But I'm certainly very pleased that people are looking at it. Um, and I did not see the article in the Times because I wasn't here this weekend to catch it. So Alex, I don't know if you want uh, to address that very quickly. I, I deny making the statement that I endorse a big box store on the President's golf course. And I note that the President's golf course is under conservation restriction and couldn't possibly be developed. All right, so we have about six minutes until our first public hearing starts at 7.15. So why don't we, as I said, we're going to weave the discussion for the zoning articles uh, throughout the, um, uh, the meeting as we have breaks between the special permit and site plan approvals that we're looking at today. So we had a good forum. Um, uh, was it two weeks ago now, last week? My uh, sense of time is... Uh, thrown off because of how busy we've all been. But uh, it was um, uh, attended by about 40 people or so, I would say, roughly. Uh, Tim and Julia have been doing a great job uh, typing up all of the responses. So we had the visual preference survey, uh, which people uh, sat and drew um, the, the circles around the things that they wanted to do. We also had a dot exercise, so they've tabulated both of those. You have the initial results were sent to you by email today, so I'm not expecting anybody to have looked at them. I had a very quick look at the results of the dot exercises, and they were, they were really interesting. Um, Tim has also put this up on the web, so anybody there can uh, actually take, who has access to the web can actually take both surveys. Tim, it's do you want to tell the, us about it? If you go to the planning board website, it's on the bottom of the page under, I believe it's 2015 planning board zoning survey. It's at the bottom of the page. It's, a, uh, it's an online survey. It recreates um, the same exercise that we did um, at the forum. So if you didn't get a chance to go to the forum on uh, June 29th, you can still chime in. We've already gotten between 130 and 160 responses, depending on, um, some people didn't really finish it. It's, it's a little long, but if you stick with it, um, it gets really good at the end. It takes about, <laughs> it takes about 15 minutes to do, I think you timed it, yeah, so. Between 12 and 15 minutes, yeah. so. And people should know that in the visual preference survey, um, uh, because we, we went through this in the, uh, in the discussions at the forum, is it's supposed to be your initial quick reaction. It's not a, a deep analysis, so. That, will, that survey will be up for about four weeks. Uh, it actually will overlap with our next forum, so we're hoping that people take it, give us some more feedback, and we'll be using the results as we get them to tweak what we present in July, and then once it closed, the final results to, present, to tweak what we present in August. And um, as we go throughout the evening, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing in July, but again, it's July 28th at the high school at 7 o'clock. Uh, whereas before I did all the, the presenting, because we had such a, site, uh, a short time to prepare for it, the various different planning board members with the different um, uh, zoning articles will be doing presenting of their individual zoning articles, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. We're going to again have some interactive sessions, which we'll talk more about tonight. 
and uh, go from there. So, Alex, I believe you said you have a report on what your status is on your zoning. So we can just do a run round of where we are if you want to start. I've submitted uh, an article on amplified music uh, for typing. I've submitted an article on non-conforming buildings in residency zones, res residency districts, and uh, I anticipate that uh, after it's typed it can be sent to Ned Corcoran since he has, uh, right. he has uh, indicated interest and the uh, uh, so-called great estate, mm -hmm. even though in my opinion the only great estate uh, basically is the Eustace estate and then there are some lesser, although very fine estates. Great estate uh, is so much easier to say than lesser but very fine estate, so. Yeah, in any event, I uh, uh, anticipate uh, some thoughts on that uh, uh, and I will uh, process them with a number of people. Great, excellent. Cheryl, how are you doing with yours? I have accumulated some of the sample um, bylaws that were Great. recommended in the master plan and I have assembled the um, there's some model um, bylaws that okay. the state has. So, um, so my next task is to, um, since we have inclusionary zoning in some of our uh, zoning code already for mm -hmm. specific sites, just to see where they need to be modified. Okay. And the same thing for the um, accessory. Okay, great. Because we have it, I think what we're going to do is modify what we have. Is that? your understanding versus a, a whole new I'm, I'm open for discussion. Okay. I think it will depend on um, what you find. Certainly some of the results on do, that are good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it might Maybe be easier, easier to do just a, a new right. section than try and redline what we have. Right. Yeah. So if you're open to that, um, I think I might suggest that's the Yeah, track have a I'll look take. at it. Okay. So the results that we received so far from the, that small sample size were pretty interesting. Yeah. Brian, how's yours? How are you coming along with yours? Brian? It doesn't get through to him. I'm here, right here. Oh, there yeah. you are. How are you doing with your zoning? <clears throat> I am, I've begun to accumulate other zoning articles to review for research, but I've been out of towns pretty much since our uh, event at, at um, Fuller Village, so I have some work to do next week. I, I'll be catching <coughs> up next week. Okay, great. So I've got uh, B&Bs are pretty much done, although I actually need to tweak them based on the results that we have now. Lighting's pretty much done. Um, sign by law and institutional review, I need to do some work on. And that brings us to 715. So let us move to the public hearing. We are going to open the continued public hearing for the special permit and site plan approval for Thayer Nursery. Because this has been such a long hearing process, I'm going to review again where we are and talk about the next steps. So the board is in the process of reviewing an application for a landscaping business. We are ensuring that we fully understand the proposed business, the impacts of that business, and the proposed solutions to mitigate those impacts. In some cases, the impacts of the landscaping business increase the impacts of conditions already present in the nursery business. For these conditions, the board may consider <laughs> mitigation measures that may reduce the impacts of both the proposed landscaping business and the nursery business. A special permit requires four out of the five members of the board to vote in favor. Only four members of this board are eligible to vote as Cheryl Tagayas was not on the board when the public hearing was opened in March. Cheryl is, however, allowed to participate in asking questions of the applicant during the public hearing process and is allowed to participate in the deliberations once the public hearing is closed. Board members should make any final requests for additional information during this public hearing. At our last meeting, we discussed closing the public hearing during this meeting. It is my understanding that there are some outstanding pieces of information due from the applicant. We will continue this public hearing to a later date to receive that information and any information required as a result of tonight's meeting. Such information must be given to the planning department the Thursday prior to our next meeting for distribution to board members and for posting on our website for public review. When the public hearing process is closed, the board will begin its deliberations on this application and identify the conditions that would be required should the board decide to grant a special permit to the applicants. 
During the deliberation process, there will be no public comment allowed, nor will the applicants or their representative be allowed to comment unless I direct them to do so in response to a direct question from a board member to me. I will consider requests from board members for clarifying information from the applicant. Just a reminder, this application and the zoning are for the landscape business and not the nursery. Comments should focus on the landscape business and not the nursery. The board expects constructive comments on the impacts and the potential mitigation. Statements in support of the application or the against the application should be short. This is a public hearing. We expect people to respect the others in the room. The board will not tolerate comments or outbursts that are derogatory toward anyone, whether in the room or absent. The board will also not tolerate interruptions of the meeting. Tonight's process will follow the same process we've followed before. We will hear a report from staff on outstanding items and any new information received. We'll get an update from the applicant or their representative on outstanding items. Board members will be able to ask questions. We will then do testimony from members of the public and I will review the rules before we do that. Then we will identify any remaining outstanding items for the next meeting. So Tim, it's over to you. Any information received from the last meeting? Um, there was some correspondence that we've received um, over the past few days from some of the um, abutting neighbors. I think that those, I, I handed those out um, for the meeting, I was like, I need them out for the board. Need them out. And uh, just to clarify, those are all entered into the public record yeah, uh, and absolutely. distributed to all of the members of the board, yes. not just those listed. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we received some information um, from the applicant uh, yesterday evening. Um, this is this package of information that you've got here. Okay. Um, it was delivered in hard copy, so it didn't have electronic copies. Um, there's a, a memorandum, there's some, some definitions of terms. Um, that might be, I suppose, of interest. Um, and I, I, I would probably ask the applicant to come up and explain what's in here. Okay. Um, and uh, finally, also, um, this afternoon, um, the applicant sent in, there was a question about um, the qualifications of their sound engineer. Okay. Um, and so that information came in uh, this afternoon, um, also included in the pile of papers I, I handed out before the okay. meeting. All right. In that case, if that's it, I will look to the applicant's representative, Ned Corcoran. Do you and your client wish to come up and walk us through this information? And also let us know what out items are still outstanding. Good evening, Ned Corcoran on behalf of Maggie and Josh Oldfield. Um, I can speak to a couple of the things that I think you received. One is a sort of glossary of terms. I think it's sort of a helpful set of definitions for the board. It's got a definition of nursery, land care yard, greenhouse, etc. Technical terms that are sort of in, in the application and some of which interpretation of what is in the bylaw. Um, there's an activity schedule which proposes or identifies in t tabular form um, when, time of day, time of year, different activities would occur, sort of bulk out agricultural products, land care, yard deliveries, time of day based on Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday, and then time of year would be sort of March through December firewood sales, Christmas sales, landscaping, snow management, those are all identified in the activity schedule. Um, I don't have the final version of the memo that was submitted. I know it was a memo prepared by um, Frank um, DeLuna, who is, uh, represents uh, the nursery in their agricultural related uses that it, I think, defines um, tries to def get at defining agriculture and nursery related uses. Um, one of the questions in response to, I think, a question that arose last week, sort of what is the land care yard? And there's an article that deals with how to set up a nursery. And there's a specific uh, reference to a propagation area, which I think is equivalent 
uh, to land care yard. It's sort of an area where um, agricultural material can be received, sort of temporarily planted so it can grow out and then is able to be um, transferred to uh, and delivered off site or purchased uh, on site in small retail uh, amounts or delivered off site. Uh, so that's sort of a two different ways to define the same thing. Um, I have not seen the qualifications that were submitted with respect to the sound engineer, so um, I can't speak to that. <clears throat> you mentioned a memo. I'm just looking for that one. I see, I see the activity schedule. I see the glossary of terms. I see. This is the memo is the, the front page. Oh, it's the front page of this. That's what's that's what you're talking about. Okay, I didn't see the last bit. All right, I just want to make sure we all have the materials we're looking for. All right, obviously we haven't had a chance to review it, having just Understood. gotten it. And I believe it's my understanding from talking to Tim and Bill that there's some drainage, a drainage plan that's still outstanding. Is that correct? Are we expecting? There were some drainage questions at the last meeting. Did I miss that? Maybe I misunderstood what they said. Is the drainage information still outstanding? Uh, just going back through my notes, I don't recall. We did. We discuss. were talking about it. There weren't any. I, and I apologize. I don't have my notes from the last meeting with me. It just stuck in my head that that was a, an outstanding issue with that. Did I miss here? I think that. But if I'm wrong on that, then that's. I think you are. I think okay, that the fine. drainage, the final, the plan, the, the last iteration of the plan that was presented showed a final component of the drainage plan, which was to adjust the size of the, the depth mm -hmm. of the swale um, that is parallel to the Roe and Johanning property line and install a 12 inch pipe that would run from that swale and connect to the uh, Caltech uh, drain system that's proposed for the area. Uh, parallel to Highlands, uh, to Hillside Street, and eventually the overflow tying into the town's drain system. Okay, all right, so then that was my misunderstanding. And has it been reviewed? Has the town engineer reviewed that last drainage plan? Um, I'm not sure. We can wait and ask Bill when he comes back. back okay. Board members, do you have any questions on this or any other material that's been presented? Well, actually, you've just walked in. Has the drainage plan been reviewed by the town engineer? It went to, I believe it went to the town engineer when it was originally drawn. So it would be the revised You had discussions one. with um, John Thompson? Uh, brief, you know, we, we haven't actually done. Come on, come forward and introduce yourself, please. <coughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Burke. I'm a registered civil engineer in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts with uh, offices in Quincy, Massachusetts. And uh, we've uh, uh, done several iterations of drainage on this particular project. And I've talked to John Thompson uh, a, a number of times with regards to how to control the runoff off this property and uh, into the town system. And what we propose now is uh, uh, kind of a new uh, swale. Uh, collection swale with a, uh, a flared end to collect the runoff and bring it towards the Caltech chambers, which have been there for uh, a bit. And uh, uh, it just gets, uh, uh, for us to control the runoff, we have to collect the runoff. So uh, uh, the drainage itself is allowed to recharge into the soils as much as possible. The soils are in that whole area are melt and are poor, um, but uh, anything's an improvement. And uh, then we have an overflow into the town system. And John Thompson reviewed the last plan that uh, you submitted that's, to us? Uh, whether he's reviewed it or not, I'm not sure. Uh, the, we've discussed uh, that type of uh, design, uh, however, in the past. Well, we're going to want to know if John Thompson feels that this drainage plan is adequate. And it's going to take more than his saying something to someone on the phone. He's going to have to do a writing yeah. uh, and conclude that uh, it's likely to address the issues that have been raised. Which is consistent with what we've been asking for the other candidates for special permits in front of us. Yeah. So, okay. 
I mean, if we're not here reviewing it, he's going to have to review it. Mm -hmm. But he's going to have to review it in the same manner as right. uh, uh, the peer review was done. So Tim, Bill, I don't know which one of you have been coordinating the peer review for the others. I think, Bill, you have. So if we could make sure that John sees the most recent yep. plan and gets it. Any other questions from board members? Yes. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I was out of town for the last mm -hmm. hearing um, on there. But I think the one prior to that, we had been working our way through um, this matrix, which Tim had prepared. I was mm -hmm. just curious whether that had been concluded. We've hit most okay. of them because uh, if you look at section four, which we've been working off, section seven is essentially the same topic, so it's okay. section four. So I think we'd gone through and we'd hit all of the topics at one point or the other of the various discussions. Okay, great. So, Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Anything else from board members? All right. If not, I'm oh, going to. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I, I do. Uh... Yeah. I'd like to, and I'm assuming we probably will, I'd like to find out where we got to with the fence and the, where the fence is going to go at this point in time. I know it, it last uh, meeting we had, it kind of, you reduced the coverage of the fence. It was suggested that maybe we shouldn't do that. And it seemed like you were taking that information as uh, something you might look at. So I'd like to know where we got to with that. Well, uh, Tina Tevens and I met yesterday, um, and we talked uh, specifically about her um, property line, um, and um, we haven't, we weren't able to touch base today, um, but I feel like we had a really good conversation, but we have to do a follow-up, um, so I don't want to misspeak because we haven't. Um, spoken since yesterday and she had to go back and speak to her husband so I just I just had a conversation with her outside of the room um, just a sort of a quick follow-up I know that and I don't want to speak for her but I understand from her perspective that a fence is extremely important mm -hmm. the potential location of the fence the type of materials might be subject to discussion but uh, in her opinion there needs to be a fence and I'm sure we'll hear from her during the public comment portion. And I have, uh, I, I just went on the internet and uh, to see what it had to say about sound attenuating fences. And I'm going to give these three articles to Tim so he can, he can, uh, he can make copies and give them to board members. But as I see it, uh, you build the fence and then your noise will either bounce off or go over the top in the direction, in the direction here. Here you have the source, here's the top of the fence. If it goes over the top, it'll keep going. It won't fall down, it'll, it'll keep going. Mm -hmm. And uh, so if this fence, if there is a truck um, and the top, part of it, the, the diesel emission. Uh, if that is uh, um, higher than the fence, then you can expect that the sound would go down. But if it's lower, mm -hmm. then the sound would, wouldn't go down. It would, it would go in the direction it hits on the top. And then, so you take whatever you start with, if this your if this is your sound emission, mm -hmm. this is your fence, then the sound will go, and then it'll keep going up. So uh, uh, the question, as I see it, uh, from these articles, and I will uh, give them to you, is uh, um, whether or not the sound creation points are higher than the top of the fence. and and the neighbors beyond. I mean, if the neighbors, if, if, if it goes like this and the neighbors are here, then mm -hmm. it's not going to do the neighbors any good. But uh, my observations on the ground is that a fence should be uh, quite, uh, quite useful. Well, I look forward to reading the articles. And here they so, are. Excellent. 
And you're exactly right that that's how it works, and that's why when we moved oh. the equipment and all of our so-called noisy activities over to the land care yard, the best fence um, is actually the 35-foot um, building that exists. So a 35-foot, um, 40 by 80 building with three walls is actually a far superior noise reduction than an eight or 10 foot fence made out of wood or with sow matting. So by the time if you're um, looking at the Tevens and Johanning and Row property line, which is how many feet away? over yeah 250 feet away and sits on the opposite side of a 35 foot tall 40 by 80 foot building if the noise as Alex says is going to go up and over it's going up and over a 35 foot building so an 8 to 10 foot fence over here um, does little or does, does not do as much as the existing building and that's why our original plan um, is what it is and we stand behind it because that building provides the best sound any other questions just a comment I, yeah. did, I think you'd still be uh, advised to continue the mm -hmm. fence mm -hmm. around right. and yes. uh, I mean, this, it seems to me it, just from I don't have any uh, first-hand uh, understanding of what goes on regularly. I drive by once in a while, but it seems to me that I keep hearing that a lot of the situations are the bobcats, and, and they're probably more continuously operated with the machine on the side, so I think it would be best to carry the fence around. And like I said before, it only stands as a, a point in your favor to make every effort to mitigate, even if you think it's doubling up on the mitigation. Then we fully understand that. We just wanted clarification. Brian, any questions from you? I'm all set at the moment. Okay, great. And just to uh, your point, Mike, about where, where we are in the situation, too, is for any of the mitigation measures, as we've collected the information from the applicant, as we've heard from the members of the public, when we get to our deliberative session, if there's a difference, then the board will have to make a decision as to what we think the conditions will be and see where we go with that. We can, so, you know, but, we can stipulate yeah. that the fence has to be a certain position and height and so forth. We can always do that. Then the applicant always has the right to say we're not going to do that, and then that throws us into another question at that point. Well, then so. we'll accept their application as is. And so. But, but just to let you know, we have that ability to determine what we would like to propose. So, all right, so since there are no further questions I, from... I have yes. a, another question, sorry. <laughs> uh, we have a petition. It's called, actually it's called Fair Nursery Memorandum. And it's submitted by a lawyer named Francis Juluna. Uh, of Martha Kalina LLP and it says that they don't need a special permit for their wood operation uh, because wood at one point was being grown. By wood do you mean firewood? firewood. Okay just double check. Firewood was at one point being grown and therefore it's basically uh, a sale of, of uh, a nursery material, although somewhat, somewhat changed from what the usual nursery uh, uh, <clears throat> sells. Now, I personally think that they do, if they want to sell firewood, they need a wood permit. This memo says we don't need it, uh, we can do it under the Dover Amendment. Um, if they can do it under the Dover Amendment, I don't think the planning board has any, uh, uh, will not try and say we're going to, we're going to nix the Dover Amendment. I don't think that's what the Dover Amendment. Is he saying Dover or is he saying agricultural exemption? Both. Both. Both? Okay, the, because I, just, I haven't had a chance to read it. Yeah, the just Dover double checking. Okay. The, yeah, agricultural ex yes. exemption. But. 
It seems to me that they have applied for wood operation, mm -hmm. and they've applied for a number of other things that presumably you could argue the Dover Amendment applies to and they could do without a special permit. But we, you know, if you want a special permit for a wood operation, fine. But don't say to us, but we don't really need this permit, so you better make it wide open <laughs> as if it were the Dover Amendment. If we give you a permit, we will attach conditions to it. And they, it won't be the same thing as doing business under the Dover Amendment. And if you don't want to apply for a special permit for a wood operation, you can say, scratch that bit of it. And that, of course, would uh, uh, make it easier for us. But uh, I, I do think that you, it, it Getting a memo like this saying we don't need a special permit for this, we can do it anyhow, we need to know just where the applicant is standing on this particular issue. Do you want the permit or do you not want the permit? Yes. So basically what this was, again, was just clarification. We do want um, the ability to sell firewood. It just was um, our position. Um, where we're coming from, and um, but it, our but you recognize you might be wrong, so you just assume get the special permit. Correct. All right. Mm -hmm. Paul, so you're not. The way I interpret it is that we're willing to give something up from our perspective to gain something on the other end. You don't give anything up no, if you don't need the special up. permit. No, we Let give up. Finish. We're giving up our ability to sell all the wood we want to sell. That's how I interpret this. Well, under the special permit, that's right. But Correct. if you have the right to sell unlimited firewood Correct. under the Dover Amendment, Correct. then you're not giving that up. Correct. Then that's what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I'm going to assume that you want the special permit and Correct. we are going to proceed without I believe we're going to proceed without any assumption that uh, what you're, you're proposing is allowed under a different, um, a different law. Right, understood. We just want to recognize that as part of the negotiation that's been going back and forth, that's a concession we're making. I see somebody with your hand up. Sir, are you a member of the applicant's team or are you a member of the public? I am Frank Lewis. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> member of the applicant's team then. I would, I would caution you that we are not talking about the agricultural exemption. Exactly you, the point of the memo. Okay. You made it very clear. So please come up forward so you can speak into the mic. You made it very clear last time that the special permit is being focused on the uh, landscaping company yes so this the permit is to allow the landscaping company to sell the firewood that the right. clarification on that maybe I wasn't as articulate but yes they fully realized that the special permit is for the sale of firewood by the landscaping company good that's excellent thank you Emily may I speak to that just for a minute yes so it sounds to me as though the applicant is suggesting that it is submitting this memo in order to suggest it has certain rights potentially under the Dover Amendment, but it's willing to uh, qualify, quant qualify what those rights are by putting them underneath a special permit for the landscaping business. Yes. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. So is, is a condition in the special permit, I guess I'd have two questions. One is, is a condition in the special permit allowed that would, uh, by, 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 by law, that would allow the planning board to acquire the zoning of the uh, Dover Amendment not be later applied uh, to extend those rights? Um, and if so, and my second question would be, do we want to do that? 
So the special permit, once it goes into the special permit as an allowed activity, then it is bound by whatever conditions that we put on that particular activity. So we would specifically right. allow the sale my, of firewood. My, my yes. question is whether the applicant would be willing to, as part of this compromise that it's suggesting it's making, right. uh, say as part of its special permit that it won't evoke rights under the Dover Amendment through a nursery business or some other right uh, outside of those parameters. But, but I just, I'm, well, I'm, well, yes. I'm, I think I got a good point to this. I'm not the lawyer here, but as I'm reading this memo, it, it, it's, it's supposedly quoting the Dover Amendment, which says no zone, zoning order, ordinance or bylaw so shall prohibit what's allowed under it. So, so, you, so basically what it's saying is we can put, if he's correct and the firewood is allowed under the Dover Amendment, then we can say all we want. And I just heard a minute ago, he said, well, you sell the firewood under the landscape business. Does that mean they're going to be selling additional firewood under the nursery business? So what I think I hear you both saying is, should we, in their special permit, uh, require that they give up the right to sell any additional firewood outside of the conditions that we put on here? I don't think that would, yeah, it would be a that. rely. Yeah, the special permit would rely on that. Condition. But that's just what the Dover Amendment says you can't do. Right. right. It says you can't. You can't legislate away their rights. That was my that was my yeah. first. So the, the the only thing we could do is go ahead with what we're doing, write it into the permit, and if they want to go and start selling firewood, and we say well you can't do it, then they could fight it in court that it's part of the Dover if, Amendment. If I think that this issue is being litigated already, uh, and I anticipate that there sometime will be a decision, uh, but. If we give a special permit for sale of firewood and say this is what you have to do to sell it, and they turn around and say, well, that's just the landscaping business, the nursery is selling firewood too. If the nursery has no right under the Dover Amendment to sell the firewood, we would take this as an egregious breach of the special permit for the landscaping business. So I think it would be appropriate at this point to ask the applicant to respond. What, what is, your inten is your intention to sell firewood only under the landscaping business, under the conditions that we might impose? My intention would be to follow that, that yes, unless we give up the whole landscaping permit, then I would say we're not landscaping anymore. We're refocusing our business model and I don't want to landscape on the property, but, but I'm going to. But if you did that, then, of course, we might not be here. Correct. But I'm just saying that might be my right down the road that I would choose to do. So, as lo so I think what I hear you saying, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that as long as the landscaping business is in operation, your sale of firewood would be under those conditions. But yes. should you choose to end that landscaping operation for whatever reason, you might revert back to your rights under the Dover Amendment to sell firewood as that lays that out. All right. Okay. That's, all, right. that's, so that's all presumption beyond our reach, beyond our right. control. I mean, you might decide someday to put up a Correct. whatever there. That's, that's completely beyond what we're discussing here. That's out of the realm of what we're looking at. But for I mean, our, my understanding yeah. is, I'll say we, mm -hmm. maybe everybody, we doesn't agree, but we don't buy into the fact that the firewood is a right under the door amendment. That's, that's irrelevant though. Right, but exactly. Us, right but now. Exactly. We believe it's part of the special permit. They'll go with the special permit. If they ever attempt to say, well, we can sell more or do different because of the Doberman, that's a different fight. And yeah. that's a different discussion. Yes. And the landscaping business has no rights under the Dover Amendment because it is not a farming enterprise. Right. And in fact, it only has the right to sell firewood if we grant it. That's a, a may under the zoning. The planning board may grant the ability to do that, but we do not have to. It's not a shall or a must. So anything else? Brian? I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Alex? Uh, no, I think that, uh, uh, I think that we're we're getting there. Cheryl, yep. Do we have um, a site plan in our possession now which reflects um, what the applicant is proposing with regard to fencing and fencing locations? 
Have you provided your final site plan to us? That might be helpful. There's no to have. No. No. no? Okay. We can. I mean, it may be that this, we think, are going to have to specify what should the plan think, should show. I think at this point um, we would uh, prefer not to spend more money on plans but wait to see what comes out of the board's determinations and then the final plan can reflect the permit as um, determined by the board. But okay. it's a moving target where and what fences are being located where. And okay, so another question then. Yeah. Um, the, <clears throat> the latest um, plan what reflects the latest storm water. Is that the most current plan? That would be the I one received. I want to make sure yes. we're looking at the most current plan. Yes. So that would be okay. the one we received June 18th. Right. Uh, did we get that electronically, um, Tim? Yes. Is, is okay. Just the, the timing possible? The 18th. Okay. You meaning that? Yeah. I guess the one I had to move. Yeah. If we make stipulations, they have to give us a plan, and the plan has to reflect the stipulations. And we have to approve the plan, so it's just going to. Once, once the public hearing, as you know, once the public hearing is closed the clock starts ticking um, for our deliberations for writing it i did speak briefly to mr corcoran a few weeks ago when i was letting him know that i was not going to allow the discussion of agriculture um, is that we would need an automatic extension because this is going to be quite a complicated um, set of conditions for us to review tim and i are already working sort of from opposite ends just not on a draft special permit but just on a draft of how the conditions would be written. I've got an outline. Tim has been going through the notes. Um, and we'd be prepared to share a, a more finished version of that with you at our next meeting. Uh, and again, it would be just to, just to as, as you know, there's still some open questions on what mitigation we would require. And so it's just to guide that. Um, but once that were done, if we, the board, came to agreement and it was something that looked like it was going to go forward, then that would still have to be worked into a draft special permit. So I think we would have to consider an automatic initial extension in, of the in clock. In which case, it isn't us that's consuming all the clock because they're going to have to update. I mean, right. all along it's been said we need specifics right. to guide people on what's going on there. Well, in my mind, one of the <laughs> most essential specifics would be a plan that shows where everything's going to be and what's going to go right. on there. And a special permit could certainly not be approved or possibly even come to a, a final vote without those plans attached to it. So I think what the process would end up being is we would move to our deliberations. We would come up with the, the mitigation that we require, the location, <coughs> and then require them to put those on a plan for our final review before we moved forward to a vote. Again, if it, yes. So with respect to that, I think the modifications to these plans can be done very quickly mm -hmm. and can be submitted back, you know, in plenty of time for a next meeting. Um, and I think that it is possible, I don't know that it's likely, but it is possible that the, based on discussions that took place between Maggie and um, Tina Tevens yesterday, it is possible that the parties, the abutters and all the parties could agree to a set of fencing requirements that would meet everybody's satisfaction I'm, I can't say personally that I'm optimistic that that would get that that would happen it's possible um, and if that's the case certainly we would prepare a plan uh, for submission in accordance with what that agreement is that agreement could happen after the close of the hearing it could happen between now and next the next meeting um, you know it's, those are possibilities and certainly uh, some sort of agreement between the applicant and the, or among the applicant and the abutters would be preferable to a board imposed condition. So, yes. Um, I do have a question um, because I think it's important relative to question of fencing. Could you um, describe how much bobcat activity is expected between um, the barn and the greenhouse and the property line to the northeast, the, the three abutting properties there. So where you have nursery stock as part, as part of this plan. How, well, so how often do you anticipate bobcats in that zone? That area tends to be the most expensive um, 
nursery stock that we have, so there is less activity in that area just based on the nature of the plant material. It's larger material that's not as common to purchase. It's uh, larger evergreens, and we did that intentionally to give us a sense of separation, but it's not a typical commodity that the average homeowner buys requiring equipment. So that type of plant, is there a time of year that that's planted? So is it that that bobcat activity would be 12 months out of the year there, six months, three months? Uh, can you give us a sense of that? Well, saying um, the material comes in by May 1st, May and June is a possible timeline and then again in the fall September through the end of October so, so it, four months and planting season would be then between that May time period and that October time period so correct so between May and October would be the likelihood of the bobcat activity in that zone or is it 12 months pretty much no no okay. it would be less than it's actually concentrated in four months in four months yes okay Unfortunately, those are the months that people hear it. Oh. I just want to understand. Yeah, you know, and the frequency during the day then would be uh, very minimal during the day, as Josh explained. The trees are larger and pricier in nature, so just typically we get a delivery in of evergreens. Uh, this year was a little bit later because of the weather, and um, just to walk you through the process. Um, in the, the spring, what we do is any material that is um, that we have growing, we dig up in the spring, we root prune, um, we re burlap, um, we, we do any pruning necessary, and then we replant. So, probably in the spring, um, that field would probably take one week to prepare and do all that activities. Each field that we have is about a week of time and investment. So for one week, it probably is a more solid bobcat um, use for one week in the spring. Once it's planted, the plants are there for the duration of the season, which is until, um, um, until basically Thanksgiving. And we only access that area if we sell plant material from that area. So we might not have a bobcat in that area for two weeks straight because we haven't sold anything from that field or there might be a customer might come in and um, want a larger sized evergreen and I have to go in with a bobcat and dig it out and put it in their truck. Um, a landscape job might occur where we might have to take 10 arborvitaes from that area and one morning it might take a half an hour to load and then it's gone. So of the um, busyness, that area is uh, the, the least busy throughout the duration of the season. Okay, and then the zone um, be on the, I guess, easterly property line, um, I know that there's the new land care yard, but then that area between the bins, number 25 through 32, and the uh, um the barn is there going to be bobcat activity in between the fence and the barn and the bins right so that is the that is. yes that that is the land care yard and that is the busier area and so that's why our proposal original proposal had the sound attenuation fence it had the berm it had the eight foot fence because we realized that that's where um, more right. daily activity right. will occur and so that's why um, we have agreed to having uh, an additional grow out area on the on our side of the fence so there's a true 30 foot um, buffer um, but it's closer to Josh's house it's more centrally located this is the area we're talking about Maggie right yeah okay yeah and before we were talking about this or Correct. were you talking about this as well no. just no, this just, right? just that yeah Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so we've agreed to um, initially in our original proposal um, was doing a forward only traffic pattern behind the barn to minimize the backup beep. But then through this whole process, um, uh, Pam said she didn't want the trucks um, in that area. So we agreed to close that area off, eliminated the forward only traffic pattern. So now all the act, um, more truck activity is closer to Josh's house 
um, um, and uh, that's where the the can compost point, will be. Can you point to that, Maggie? Yeah, right where okay. Madison. Thank you. Right there. Yeah. And I think you may actually have a slightly older plan because I, it's yeah, not yeah. showing the the narrowing around the barn that prevents trucks from uh, coming okay. through and the landscaping okay. on there that we received at the last one. The received date on this is June 16th. Okay. So that's the it may have been current. another one. Is that your date? Uh, the title block date, it says uh, June 15th. 15th, yep. Okay. On the revision. All right, so that then we the need to. Okay, so then we had talked about at previous meetings. Um, this is going that was bumped out a little bit more, and this area has been narrowed from the original proposal so that the trucks could not move through there. So I mean, most of the activities is going to be around the loose materials and the bins. Correct. So on the westerly side of those bins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the load, we can't, we can't, according to the zoning, the loading is, um, has to occur um, 40 feet in. So even though the fence is 15 feet and then there's an additional 15 feet in front of that, the loading area is an additional 10 feet away. So the total area of the closest truck is 40 feet. Anything else from board members? I want to make sure that we get the public comment period in before our next public hearing starts. Anything else? All right. In that case, we're going to ask you all to step back. Hang on. I'm going to open the public testimony part, give the uh, usual rules. So here's a reminder, wait to be recognized before speaking. Come to the table and give your name and address. Speak into the microphone. When you are done, please leave the table. Now, we do have two other hearings tonight, so speakers may only speak once. All questions or comments must be directed to the chair. Speakers may not cross-examine the applicant, board members, or other speakers. Applicant will be asked to respond to questions at the end of the public input section. Now, we've had, I recognize a number of faces, so I'm going to ask first if there's anybody here who has not spoken at a previous public hearing. So in that case, the first hand I saw was yours. Come on up. Tina Tevens, 39 Parkwood Drive, Director Butter. So I just want to um, go over the comments. Maggie and I did meet yesterday, and one of the discussions were the fence, um, was the fence, and we walked the property. Um, and just to go over, I'm actually going to Take the mic with you if you okay. want to point the things. So looking at the plan, this is our property here, and this is what they use as a grow out area, and this is where trees, what you were discussing, bobcats come, they load, they unload. So there is activity, and I do get, you know, bobcat noise here. Um, so when Maggie and I were walking, you know, we talked about the fence. This is Pam Lapore's property coming up and coming back. And I just felt that there was ambiguity to where exactly the fence was going to be placed. So Maggie, actually, they had some um, orange paint. Mm -hmm. And they had put it down. And she said, OK, from Pam's property line, she showed me the 15-foot marker coming off Pam's property where the fence would then go, and then walking back to our property. We have a buffer, a little bit of shrubbery there right now. I'm going to say it's like seven or eight feet of, you know, Charlie Brown trees. It's not a lot. You can see, you know, directly into our property. And then we do have some trees that were planted that Josh had mentioned before that are all dead. So Maggie mentioned, you know, that those trees and then the shrubbery and then where the um, fence would actually be placed. And then in walking back here, if you actually walk from my property to Joe Henning and Row, there's at least a 42-inch drop-off. I am definitely, our property here, Chris and I have a higher elevation than when you go to this property. So in placing the fence, you know, on our property, it's a little easier. You can see that you could run a straight shot. And then it gets a little convoluted when you go over to the Joe Henning Row because they are at a lower elevation, and then you get into the water problem, you know, the drainage issue, then it's mud. You know, you really couldn't, can't put a fence into mud. So what I said to Maggie is our first choice is definitely not a wood fence. I mean, this is not an area. It's shaded. There's water. 
you know, I don't want to deal with this and go down this rabbit hole again. Everybody knows and not to go back in history, but we started this in 2002 and here we are again in 2015 and talking about the same things. So I'd really want something permanent. And my feeling is a chain link fence, you put it up, you don't have to maintain it like you would a wood fence and not to go back. And my big thing is definitely the acoustical barrier and getting some type of sound attenuation on that because I don't want to go through this again. We definitely, there's always going to be a bobcat. There's always going to be a bobcat accessing these trees. There's always going to be a truck that has to access this area to unload the trees. So there's always going to be activity. So knowing that, I'd like something permanent. But where the exact location of the fence you know, I'm willing, and I said this to Maggie, is to meet and to meet with Josh and to meet with my husband and actually walk and say, okay, ideally, obviously Maggie doesn't want to give up any of her property. And we want the best buffer that we can. So somewhere in the middle, there needs to be a compromise, and I definitely realize that, and we're willing to discuss that. So that's what we talked about yesterday. But the slippery slope is, this really, to me, for an acoustical barrier, it needs to be continuous. So you really need to start it. If you're starting at one point, you can't then have an opening because that makes no sense. If you have an opening, sound's going to go through the opening. So whatever is decided here, you really have to have a straight shot, you know, and agree to that to go across. Because if we if we have a you know 15 foot run and then open it up seven feet and then go another 15 feet, that's not creating the barrier you know, the, the permanency. So I think that really needs to be looked at closely as far as the actual placement. Yeah. Great. That's it, short and sweet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody else wish to speak? Yes, sir, I see your hand next. Uh, Mike Giuliano representing. Please come up and have a seat and introduce yourself. Um, Mike Giuliano uh, with Eagle Brook Engineering from uh, Danvers, Massachusetts, representing uh, Philip Joe Henning and uh, John Rowe. I just want to briefly just talk about surface water flow because mm -hmm. I know they had a concern about um, water flowing from the nursery property onto their property, and they retained my surfaces just to look at it, to validate it or not validate it. Um, and so I looked at previous topographic maps and the different surface areas of the property over the years, and kind of walked the property. And then we had a a, um, a site visit with the. Uh, nursery owners on June 2nd and with the attorneys um, and before that night before it rained about 1.3 inches um, for about you know, four or five hours and so on our property uh, and I say ours I mean Roe and Joe Hanning in the morning of June 2nd they take that mic with you yes. On the morning of June 2nd, um, there's a, there was a lot of ponding area here, and water was flowing onto the abutting property and then flows out towards the street. And actually, it was a significant flow, so it was a lot of water. And then we met on the property um, and walked it. Um, and in this area here, there's kind of, a, kind of a walkway, but there was like a rivulet area where you can tell there was a lot of water, not only velocity, but volume of water coming from this area here. Um, and there was some ponding of water here. And then we went to our property, uh, all of us, and kind of looked. And there was a different opinion as far as whether or not water from the nursery actually flows onto our property. Mm -hmm. And then our meeting ended. Uh, so my next step was, was to wait for a storm event. So on June 28th, we had a storm event of, I think it was like 1.7 inches. It was early Sunday morning. So I went out there Sunday morning, 7 or 8 o'clock. And what I saw was a tremendous amount of water coming from here. And then it just flows right onto our property at two locations. One's over in here, another location here. And this whole area just ponds. And this whole area was just wet, um, probably an inch and a half or two inches of, of water. And, and it's a tremendous amount of runoff coming you know, from the nursery property. You know, it's a woodbridge soil, so it, it, it's very tight. It's a glacier till, uh, a lot of runoff. And it just confirmed that that the nursery flow, surface water flow, is flowing onto our property and then causing ponding areas. And then what it does is when, once it builds up a little bit of a head, it then then flows out to Parkwood Drive into the drainage system. Over in here, 
water just pours over the stone wall. Um, and there's a large pond area. And this is only a 1.7 inch rainfall event, which is roughly about a, a one year storm event. And I have, if the board would like, pictures of what I saw that day. Um, if the board would if like. If you have them with you, that'd be great. I just have, um, I have three copies. We can share them around and make sure one of them gets into the record. So the, the first set, the first picture just shows that area that I'm talking about. We have Rivalet area okay. where water comes down. That's where most of the water is coming from. And then the, um, the second photograph basically shows water coming through the stone wall. That's basically our property line under the stone wall and flowing onto our property. The third picture actually shows water ponding and then going through the chain link fence onto our property. Uh, and there's two locations on that photograph of where it actually enters the property. And that water is roughly, during that 1.7 inch involvement, it was roughly six to 10 inches deep. So it was, it was fairly, fairly, you know, large volume of water. The, that's, what's the third picture? That's the fourth picture. It shows the yard of uh, Joe Henning and Rowe. Uh, you see some small pond areas. But whole, that whole area I kind of highlighted in red. There's about an inch of water. You actually you can't see it because it's basically below the, the top of the grass here. But that whole area is just, just has an inch of water. And it kind of flows in the northerly direction towards Parkwood. Emily? Yep. Yeah. Can we have the uh, applicant's engineer? Uh, they 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 will get to speak at the end of the public comments, but if board members have questions, because this is um, a complex subject, if you wish to ask questions of them, you may do so. Well, I just want to mention, I, um, I feel as if the civil engineering component of this really is, I rely upon the engineers for mm -hmm. their, um, how they're, if they're, if the, proposed design, uh, the most recent one, how it would address the, this kind right. of runoff. Yeah. Right. I mean, the whole purpose... Actually, that's, that's my next yeah. question. Right. I mean, the whole purpose of the ahead. presentation is just to confirm that water is flowing, because I think when we yeah. went out there, we did go out with Mr. Burke yep. at that site visit, mm -hmm. and there was just a different opinion of whether the water flows from the nursery onto our property, and then during the storm event, I confirmed that that's exactly what happens. And so that's you know, the reason for me being here is to have on record that water is flowing, surface water is flowing onto our property from the nursery property. It's uncontrolled, a lot of sediment in it. And the last two pictures shows the area of hillside in, in Harland where water just pours over the stone wall um, uh, and then it ponds in that corner over there. So there's, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of storm water because there's nothing that is allowed to go into the ground because of the, the, the glacier till and the area, uh, as far as adjacent to the buildings, are all high-packed gravel with the machinery running over it. So nothing can really go into the ground. And you can tell by the, the amount of water that we had. It was only 1.7 inches, and it had a tremendous amount of runoff. Did Questions you look at the, uh, okay. what was the date of the plan? Uh, the, the, plan? the 15th of June. I saw the latest plan, and it doesn't address the surface water flow. And I'd be you know, willing to work with the applicant to make sure this doesn't happen anymore. But the drainage plan, in my opinion, does not address this, this issue. And you gave your firm name, but just for the record, if you can give your professional, so we have it on tape. If you uh, just my name is Michael uh, Giuliano, J-U-L-I-A-N-O, uh, professional engineer, professional land okay. surveyor. What, I wanted, did, that's what, what, I wanted what to have. did they address if they didn't address the surface water flow? Um, they have an area of infiltration systems here that uh, are about six feet deep. This particular area, groundwater table is probably at 30 inches, so a lot of these in underground infiltration systems, in my opinion, are gonna be in the groundwater table. They've got some type of uh, drywall here, which doesn't really address the problem that's over in here. So I, I think there's, there's, there's more detail that's needed as far as Preventing surface water flowing onto the road to your heading property. So, the, hang on, there was Mike, the, Mike spoke first. Sorry. Were the uh, increasing the depth of the swale that runs along the property line there? I think creating some type of berm along this entire edge so water can't flow in that direction will help. Well, isn't, isn't in fact, deepening the swale 
creating? Well, right now it is a swill. No, no, but I say they're deepening the swill. Deepening the swill? Would you catch more water? You'll, you, you, you'll catch more water, but I, I think what's, what you really need is a, is a physical barrier to prevent water from going in a northerly direction. Well, but if you, you said it's the groundwater. If it's the groundwater, you'd have to... No, it's not the groundwater. It's, it's well, surface You said water. it was the height of the groundwater in that area. Height of the groundwater as far as in relation to the infiltration systems. So, like, these infiltration systems really aren't going to infiltrate any water. Well, they're going to infiltrate the groundwater, you <laughs> It basically will collect the groundwater, and it'll actually be, they'll be full. Did you consider the fact that they're telling us that the hard pack that's in the area we have highlighted in pink is now going to be planted areas and more permeable? Um, I'm not sure how permeable it can be because it is a glacial till material, so what that depth? material is not going to change. It's a glacial till to what depth? Um, well, I have the web soil... Um, Do we have borings or any kind of test pits in that area? I don't believe. I talked to uh, Jim Burke about whether they did soil tests for the infiltration systems. I believe he said he, they did not. Um, soil logs from the, um, from the soil report online from um, the uh, National Resource Conservancy District, you know, glacier <coughs> chills going down. It's actually a drumlin, so it could be anywhere from 20 to 100 feet deep. No, you get, to, you get to respond at the end of all the public okay. comment. Mike, Cheryl's got a question before you ask your next one, Cheryl. Uh, I was just going to ask the same question Mike did about the swale, but I, oh. I, again, would just like to request that we have opportunity to hear from the applicant's Absolutely. engineer um, before we conclude. Yes, they will get a chance to respond. Yeah. So. And I think that once we hear from the applicant's engineer that this the tape of this has to be provided to John Thompson, and he has to he has to address it as part of uh, his review. As part of his review, because uh, I mean, if you care to address it uh, in a report, that would be great. But uh, uh, we do have what you've said on, on tape, tape, and yes. I think that it has to uh, uh, it has to be reviewed. Yeah, just, absolutely. Just to briefly reiterate yeah. what yep. Alex said: if you if you want to feed information to the town engineer that uh, disputes the uh, capabilities of the design system, then do so. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. You may call you. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right, uh, we're continuing on. Yes, ma'am. I saw your hand earlier. Please come up. Thank you very much, and you do a wonderful job of running this meeting, and I haven't said that before. Um, my name is Carol Stocker, 291 Hillside Street. Before I came to this meeting, I um, tried to contact a couple of other abutters who I had not heard from to mm -hmm. say and had not spoken to say that I was coming to the meeting and did they want to come and say anything. And I didn't succeed in reaching one, but I did reach another one the second one who is my abutting neighbor and is another abutter of Thayer's across the, across the street. I'm at 291 Hillside Street. John Waltman is a lawyer who lives at um, 289 Hillside Street. And he sent me this text, and I'm just going to read his text because I've spoken for me. Um, John Waltman wrote, quote, we are on the Cape, go as my rep, tell them I very much support Thayer. End of text. Thank you very much. Anybody else wish to speak? Yes, sir, please come forward. Phil Johanning, 23 Parkwood Drive. Um, I had sent two letters to Tim, uh, which I would like to read. Okay, Phil, you can read the letters. Yes. Or you can ask questions, but you can't, given our time constraints tonight, you can't read the letters and then... I continue to ask questions. We're going to take the letters as your statement. And that will be true. That would be true of anybody reading letters, by the way, given our time constraints. That's fine. So, okay, great. This letter is uh, signed by um, uh, the Director of Utters, uh, myself, John Rowe, Pam Lapori, Chris Stevens, Tina Stevens, and Stephen Davis. Uh, we, the undersigned Director Butters, are writing to express our concern over the planned premature termination of the public hearings for the special permit application by Thayer, Thayer Nursery, Maggie, and Josh Oldfield. Our concern comes from the fact that there are many issues contained in the zoning bylaw amendment passed by town meeting 
in May 2014 that have not been addressed or adequately addressed during the public meetings heretofore. As a result, interested members of the public have not had the opportunity to comment on those issues. They are an enforceable 2012 baseline. We recommended the 2012 tax return for the business as availability, accuracy, and consistency are assured compared to other baselines. The duration of the initial special permit. As compliance has been an issue in the past, we recommend six months. The proposed hours of operation compared to the existing special permit. We think that the existing special permit is the most relevant because uh, you know, you're supposed to mitigate the impact compared to what exists today. And what exists today is the existing special permit for the property. The bylaw amendment was written to give increased protections for neighbors compared to existing conditions. Enforceable specifics meant to control noise, light, and odor, to promote safety, and to reduce inconvenience to neighbors. The building inspector also urged the board to identify enforceable specifics. Insufficient attention has been given to alternative physical layouts and operations which could be more compatible with the interests of all of others and their rights to reasonable quiet and enjoyment of their property. A mitigation plan which identifies each source of noise, dust, odor, and also identifies effective measures to reduce and control each source. All of these things are from the bylaw itself. And, uh, you know, I don't know that each source has been, I don't know if we have discussed um, measures to reduce and control each source. I don't know that we have gone to that level of detail. A lighting plan using lighting fixtures appropriate to a residential neighborhood, um, idling rules for equipment, storage of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. The location must be more than 35 feet from the lot line. But we also don't know what type of containers. Uh, in some cases, we've gone into tremendous detail. We've looked at fence material. We've looked at uh, 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 you know, sound uh, reduction material. But we haven't looked at what are these containers anyway. Um, the speci specific schedule for upgrades to the site which will provide additional protections to the abutters and other neighbors. Like, uh, uh, we, uh, we would like to see all upgrades completed before the special permit is issued. Because if, if that doesn't occur, we might never get the protections that uh, the, the uh, bylaw amendment was supposed to, to give to us. A complete existing conditions plan with all utilities included, like water wells, uh, water lines, gas lines, etc. cetera. Um, demonstration by the applicant that the uses that they propose are in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the Milton zone, zoning bylaws as required by the zoning bylaws and mass general laws. The board will note that all of the above items contained in the bylaw amendment, the Milton zoning bylaws and mass general laws are for the protection of abutters the bylaw amendment makes almost no mention of protecting the financial health of the applicant. The direct abutters have made reasonable requests. They are sound attenuating 10-foot continuous fence from the Cole Johanning Row property line to Forest Street placed above any hollows to give maximum protection to abutters. Hush kits for bobcats or replacement with more recent, quieter, perhaps electric models. Reduced hours of operations particularly on weekends and holidays, effective drainage plan that protects abutters, elimination of large delivery trucks in favor of smaller box trucks for the safety of pedestrians and protection of our already structurally poor and narrow roadways and the elimination of damage to roadway shoulders. We sincerely hope that the public hearings can go forward into the future with meaningful discussions regarding the protections of abutters and other neighbors consistent with the bylaw amendment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody else? Yes, sir. Please come forward. John Rowe, 23 Parkwood Drive. And I would like to uh, talk about the fence. Okay. Several meetings ago, more than several, I don't know, this board voted that they wanted a 10-foot chain link fence with sound attenuation from Forest Street continuously over to the Johanning Row Coal 
property line. And I believe that that's the start of a permanent solution. Um, I'd like to show you on the map. And one of the things is the elevation. And Alex talked about the elevation with um, the research he did on the internet. And, and really, for the sound attenuation fence to work, the uh, source of the noise must be lower than the fence. Right here where they're proposing to put the fence is in a gully. The elevation is, I think, 186. The elevation of my property is um, 180. So where they're proposing to put the fence is at 180 when the noise of the um, construction lot is done at uh, 186 feet. So their proposed eight foot wooden fence is um, uh, uh, only two feet, offers two feet of protection. Let him finish and then, yes. And so what we're suggesting is there be a 10 foot fence that the board voted on that they wanted with sound attenuation um, that goes in front of the hemlocks or on the Thayer Nursery side of what they call the line of logs. The line of logs is, re is, is referenced in the 1987 special permit. We believe that the fence placed there at the same level as the construction yard where all of the um, bobcats and trucks operate is the appropriate place for the, for the fence to work. Now, I think, Cheryl, you talked about, yeah. Can I just uh, clarify something? The, the existing grade at the back of your house is about, about 178, correct? I think the plans say 180. All right, 180. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I'm only looking at plans yeah, that uh, Giselle and Burke put together. I don't know. And just what you said, the base of the fence is starting at what elevation? 180. That's, that's the elevation of the gully, or swale. I call it the gully. Do you call it a swale? So what we'll do is we'll get clarification uh, when the applicant speaks to ask exactly what elevation the fence would be put at. Okay. So we have and that. I think, you know, Here, what really would probably be what would really, really be um, useful is you, if you just came to my backyard and looked at, looked at it. I mean, it becomes crystal clear that the elevation of the construction yard where the bobcats and dump trucks are, um, and uh, you know it is at at least 186, and that's where the base of the fence should be. And it they're not losing any land if they put it in front of the hemlocks because they can't plant anything in the swale anyway. Um, I just want to clarify mm -hmm. truck traffic. This grow-out grow area does not exist today. This is a parking lot with a party tent right on my property line. Are we saying that that, prop that, that party tent is going to be moved and that this is going to be a grow-out area? And the filling station is here. So all of the bobcats and trucks will have to go through this area to fill up with diesel fuel. So I just want the board to know there's a significant amount of bobcat traffic and um, truck traffic in the back lot here where you know the applicants have admitted themselves that the barn itself has created an echo chamber. So all of this noise goes this way all the more reason to have a 10-foot fence, continuous fence, that goes from the Cole to Heading Row property line continuously to Forest Street. And you'll note that the applicant on the plan stops the fence here. It should go to the Rojo Heading property line. What good is a fence here stopping, you know, three quarters of the way? It doesn't really make any sense. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, one more thing. Yes. Um, Mr. DeLuna talked about the firewood uh, distribution business being covered under the Dover Amendment. Um, the town believes that the Dover Amendment doesn't apply here. As um, the courts um, in two or, two or three occasions have also said that the Dover Amendment, Amendment doesn't apply. Um, I believe the wood distribution business, 1,000 cords of wood a season, is a high impact industrial use that has no business in a residential neighborhood. You have a film um, that we took from their website. I encourage you to watch that and think about, by the applicant's own testimony, that they receive up to four tractor trailer trucks of wood, as shown in the video, and all of that wood goes out of there in one week and generally all day Saturday and Sunday. Um, this is a business that other landscapers in town have moved off site. They are nursery themselves, moved this off site uh, this year, um, and they're still in business. I don't see any reason why we have to have a high impact industrial use and the volume in this residential neighborhood, it just is inappropriate. We don't have any issue with them selling cash and carry firewood as the Board of Appeals allows in their special permit. I don't think any of the neighbors have issue with that. It's the um, high impact distribution center. Um, it's a distribution center that belongs in an industrial zone, not even a commercial zone, it belongs in an industrial zone and we are in a residential zone. There's, it, it zones residential. So, thank, thank you. you very much. Does anybody else wish to speak from members of the public? If not, as per our usual practice, I'll ask the applicant and the representatives to come forward and address anything that they have heard that they wish to address. And then we're going to discuss our next steps. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Ned Corcoran. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. Um, I, I, first, with respect to the drainage, I think it's important that Jim Burke review representations made by Mr. Giuliano this evening and obviously speak with John Thompson. I think that's an important yes. conversation to happen. Uh, I would also just want to clarify at least the original proposal with respect to the location and the height of the fence. Um, the height of the fence, the, the fence is set, the base of the fence is set at elevation 184. It is not set in the swale. Okay. It's four feet above the swale, and it's proposed that the height of the fence would be 10 feet and that the, uh, the top of the fence would be maintained at elevation 192, uh, so that it would be, um, excuse me, 194, so that it would be well above uh, the height. It is not, and it has never been proposed to be located at the bottom of the swale. I think that's a gross misrepresentation. Thank you for that. With respect to that, I don't have any other comment. Okay. Uh, I also have something to clarify, which is the board has not taken any votes on anything so far. I think with the fence, we had a meeting where we thought we were coming to a consensus that we could then put in as a condition. It's clear that there's a difference of opinion as to exactly where the fence should be, how high, and what materials. So the board has not voted on anything just yet. So we're going to be continuing this public hearing. Tim, what's our, uh, what's our schedule for the next meeting? Um, July 23rd, which is our next meeting, we have uh, one public hearing scheduled at 7.15 p.m. Um, and that's all she wrote for that one. Um, and then uh, the meeting after that uh, for August 13th is also even wider open. There's nothing scheduled. Yet, okay, so. and that's 333 Brush Hill Road, right? 333 Brush Hill Road is happening, yes. Okay. That's the, the public hearing scheduled for 7.15 okay. next meeting. So 7.45? On the 23rd, does that sound reasonable to all of you? What is well, the, we what is the first public hearing? Uh, 333 Brush Hill Road. It's a site plan approval for the three That's new Brushwood? Condos. Yes. Yeah. And they're ready uh, Tim, to go. do you know that that meeting's going to happen? It's been continued a couple of times. Uh, That's a good point. We may want to do a, a 7.30. Um, I, I, I was planning on, 
I, I was planning on getting in contact with uh, the applicant tomorrow uh, to remind them of the uh, Thursday before the meeting policy for materials. Um, if they don't feel confident that they're going to be able to make the hearing, um, you'll be the first to know. So in that case, we should probably, it's a very good point, Brian, we should probably do it for 7.30 just in case. Um, will John Thompson have the ability to look over these drainage plans in order to be ready for the 23rd? I mean, weeks. I realize, yeah, in two weeks. Sorry, I didn't hear you. No, I was actually asking Bill. <laughs> I would not presume to ask somebody else what the, the town schedule is, just because I know, Bill, you've got a general idea you'll, you'll of what his work You'll need to get him a final for. completed yeah. design that you hope to have him accept ASAP so he has time to review it. So do you have time to do that? Are we going to be able to have that? I, I would like to get some feedback from him on the current one. And okay. Some feedback from Mr. Mike Giuliano uh, about his... Uh, then I think I should ask both of you, would you be able to, and actually you should both come forward if you don't mind, Mr. Giuliano. Yes. Uh, I'm just thinking that if we're to receive anything, there's really one week. Exactly. Right? That's what I want to clarify. So in order to get anything to the board for review, we'd need it the Thursday before, which would be this coming Thursday. The two of you, would you be able to have conversations and also uh, discuss with um, our town engineer sufficient that you'd be able to get something to us by next Thursday or should we be putting this off to August I think is the question and Bill I see your hand up um, you want something from John by Thursday yes is that likely so to happen they can't give it to John on Thursday and expect to get they an answer back week. right can you get Tuesday. something by the beginning of the week of next week yeah yeah, I mean, you know, he has... Uh, I, I understand yeah. you, you and John, I'm talking more. Oh, yeah. You and Mike, can you oh. both get together and have something <clears throat> for John by Monday that... Just coming to be Tuesday. Tuesday yeah. not, this, not this Monday. <coughs> Today's <laughs> Thursday. Yep. Uh, I'm seeing... It's tomorrow. Right, can 13. Can you me something? I have to have something to them by the 16th. <laughs> Uh, not likely, uh, I, you know. Uh, we, we want to. We can see. talk about. We can talk about the current design and, and, and uh, you know, uh, and maybe some slight alterations. But uh, what Mike's concerned about, we mentioned groundwater. Uh, it's a perched water table, mm -hmm. um, and you know, there's certainly I've I've punched through till and found some great gravel below it um, in the past. Not necessarily in this location, but it does exist. Um, so, uh, you know, probably a soil test would be necessary and uh, uh, at minimum and, uh, and then possible revision of the design uh, would then put from Mike. I don't, I don't see the design changing much. Um, I think some input from uh, the town engineer at this stage it would be helpful. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but in the meantime, to have a, a soil test to get dig safe going, um, uh, just, I don't think you know, we'd be able to hit that date. Okay. I was just going to suggest, in light of that, it might be more appropriate to put it off to the 13th. We could put it off to the 13th. That would actually give Tim and myself some time to really come up with a solid draft of the conditions for the other members of the board to discuss. Let's give um, it two hours. Two hours on the 13th. I think that makes sense. Absolutely. So let's do it for the 7:15 on the 13th of August. And, um, Can I make one quick comment before you continue? Absolutely. Uh, I just want to generally encourage the applicant to, uh, on the fence, to uh, communicate to the extent that it's possible uh, with the neighbors and try again to the extent that it's possible to come up with some consensus on what the material would be, uh, you know, chain link versus wood. And also, to put, it, put to bed this, this issue about the height of the fence, uh, it would be great if we could start referring to the elevation of the top of the fence instead of worrying about where it's installed. So I, I did hear Mr. Corcoran refer to, I think, 192 and 194 feet. I'm not sure which is accurate. But going forward, if, if we could start referring to how high the fence can be based on the elevation uh, from the top of the fence, I think that may be helpful to uh, move the conversation along. 
Yeah, and that's a good point too in that uh, continuing this to August would allow those conversations about the fence to happen and hopefully get resolved as much as possible. I mean, we, the board members, I think we're all aware that there may be some things that are just simply not agreed to and we're going to have to make our decision during the, during the deliberation phase. But as much as possible, if we can get to agreement, that will make everybody's lives a lot easier. So I just offer that up. Anything else? So 13th at 7.15, and Tim, please block out two hours for that. So this, this will be our first priority on the 13th. All right, we're going to move on to our next item of business. That is the special permit, site plan approval, and scenic road public hearing for 865 Brush Hill Road. This is continued from our previous meeting, and I am going to Read through the usual as soon as I find it. So we're going to have the update from our, um, our planning staff, update from the applicant on information that we've received from them, questions from board members, testimony from members of the public, and I will, of course, read the rules for that at the time. And I believe we were talking the last time about possibly closing this public hearing tonight and moving to deliberations. So let's see where we are. Tim, anything for us on this? Um, uh, Cheryl, would you mind? Oh, again? sure. Um, uh, last week, um, the applicant submitted some um, updated materials that had been requested um, at the previous hearing. Um, an exhibit on a tree preservation and protection plan. You all should have hard copies and electronic copies of these. Um, a, um, a, a schedule, uh, sort of a rough construction schedule that looks like this. Um, a construction and management phasing plan, basically um, how the, um, the different you know, pods are going to be built and in, in, in progress. Um, and then some extra plans that I have a big copy here that I'll put out in front. Um, and you should have gotten color copies of these. Uh, 4D, a tree preservation plan. Um, 6A, oh no, these are not, no, these are not new. These are old, I'm sorry. But we have them, we should look at them. Um, <laughs> I, I, I can, can I actually ask Deb to, sure. to go over what she sent? Because Before she does that, can I just say thank you very much for making our deadline. We really appreciate it. We so. worked very hard to do that. Thank you. Yeah, she sent a lot of documents, and we'll be able to explain them. All yours. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, do you, where would you like me to start with the engineering focus or these two plans? Just what you submitted. Oh, okay. sorry. Yeah. And just again for the record, well, I can, name. I can do that quickly, and then you can respond. So I, okay. Yeah. So what was submitted was some new sheets. There was a there was a new sheet too, mm -hmm. devised to identify additional waivers from the uh, roadway requirements um, that came out of the niche report and which in our comments in response. Mm -hmm. um, 4D, uh, tree preservation plan, um, essentially the plan that we presented two weeks ago, but which was updated with some nomenclature uh, uh, with respect to trees to be saved uh, or not. And then that matches up with the written mm -hmm. tree preservation plan. It was a revised sheet five, which revised grading and drainage to show modifications to the infiltration system in response to the NIT report, basically an additional row of Caltech type systems at the large drain, drain at detention system on the uh, southeasterly side of the property. Um, it was sheet 11, construction detail modifying the drainage system, a specific modification shown as a detail with respect to that modification Correct. on the construction detail plan, sheet 11. And sheet 13 also had an amended uh, construction detail dealt with the inclusion of a sediment trap detail. Um, so those were the five plans. They were uh, essentially re a, a modify, uh, re revisions to plans that had previously been presented. There were two written submittals. There was a tree preservation protection plan in written form and a construction management and phasing plan uh, in written form. And I think those were the, um, those were the uh, deliverables that were 
um, submitted. I don't I'll think. Add that. to that. <coughs> yeah. Um, Deb Keller, McKenzie Engineering. Just to add on top of that, I did add uh, provide a supplemental drainage report. Correct which uh, updated the narrative with uh, incorporating some additional description of some of the drainage as uh, requested by niche um, updated the the modeling or the hydrocad modeling um, to account for the drainage um, that was asked for uh, by niche with re with respect to uh, surface conditions and um, soil types and and then just um, via email, it was uh, clarification. They were asking for why we had a uh, cross section, a roadway cross section for stations four to five on the construction details, specifically showing that uh, layer of crushed stone, which I believe we discussed at the last meeting, which was um, in conjunction with um, trying to save and maintain and preserve the beech tree. So I, yeah, I that does that covers it. Fair enough. <laughs> Any questions from board members? Is what the drainage? Are, is everyone signed off? A peer reviewer and they. Uh... Are we on peer review, Tim? Um, we have. Which one is here? Because um, he's been dealing with the town engineer on this. Um, I, I believe, and um, I'm gonna I'm gonna when Bill gets back, I'm gonna have them confirm this. But that um, John Thompson, the town engineer, has looked at both the niche report and the applicant's response and um, has uh, verbally given the A-OK, -okay, um, hasn't had time to, to write a, a written um, response, but that is that is forthcoming and he'll deliver that to the board. That's uh, that's my understanding from my discussion with Bill that we would get it, I believe, next week. Is, is yeah. the peer reviewer peer reviewing the response? I don't know that. We did ask for I him to. It's my understanding that he's not, that, that John Thompson had taken ownership of the final review when okay. he was making the determination as to whether our responses were adequate with okay. respect to what that was That I had not talked to Bill about. So we'll get him, when he comes back, we'll get him to double clarify yeah. that. But. I, th I thought we were going to have Mitch okay. accept and comment on this. All right, so we'll have uh, Bill clarify responses. where we are. Any other? Yes, Cheryl. Um, I have some comments on some of the uh, documents that we received? Go right ahead. Okay. So on the um, tree preservation plan, um, <coughs> the magenta color ones, um, I just wanted to see if, if you could explain, there's a few trees in particular that I'm wondering if you can shift to the cyan color. Because, um, and that would be... <laughs> <laughs> we go with green, red, and pink. <laughs> because so are not inferior decorators. <laughs> well, having read through the documents, I don't have a lot of confidence that the magenta oh, wow. ones are going to make it from what I've read. So, and there's not much teeth. There's not to bite into to, to s that these are actually going to make it. So, the 18-inch oak and the 15-inch maple by the male box mm -hmm. structure. There seems to me like that's an area in which there's not significant earth moving there. And it seems to me those two ought to be able to be in our cyan. Um, cyan being a blue? Yes. <laughs> you don't know your printer colors, the printer? CMYK. Dot matrix printer that seems to keep working. So. <laughs> those two in particular because they're closest to Brush Hill Road. Um, and in the, the two that are um, next to the Depe house, again, I'm not quite sure, since you're not moving the house or the landscape, if there's yeah. a particular issue with those. When Alan and I, Alan Ackerman, the landscape architect, and I walked the site, uh, we saw those two, and they're actually growing up into the stone wall. So ah, that's, okay. Why, okay. that's why they were, okay. we were like, well, it'd be nice to save them, but we'll have to see how it works okay. out. Okay, good. Uh, fair enough. And then um, coming down by between uh, buildings 12 and 13, the, the two trees there, uh, is there a lot of earthwork there? Is that, um, I wasn't uh, seeing as much... As to there, why. there isn't. I think I would suggest that the 22 stay magenta only because of the proximity to the yeah. building itself. Um, so we would we you consider the changing the 14 then? And then the same thing up um, uh, between buildings uh, two and three. Um, is it possible to save the 24 inch? 
more likely than the 28 inch? Again, kind of looking at the topo yeah. mark. Well, and then I had 12 and 13. Sorry, Cheryl, was it 12 oh. and 13 that you said first? The very okay. first ones I said are actually um, next to number 12 to the. I, I got the mailbox okay. one. Yep. I got the house. Oh, yeah. And the then third, the, sorry, the third third set when you were talking about between two buildings. Was okay. Between so between but buildings two and three. Um, Before that one. Oh, all right. Between buildings 12 and 13. 12 13. Okay. That's um, the, yeah. 14 inch, 14. I guess. Okay. Thanks. So we're talking about four additional, four trees shifting over. And I think um, that would be great. And on the. Um, You've, you've shifted them over, but... From magenta to cyan. I had, you've changed the color, but how does that make them more likely to be saved? Well, cyan they was the highest say priority, that to be yeah. saved rather than that they're at high risk. So it seems to me that the protections are, are higher. The cyan is and a higher priority saving. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. okay, so you take it as sort of a guarantee. Okay, um, that's fine. I'm asking them to make greater effort, basically, yes. to save those, right? The protocol associated with to be saved, yeah. uh, absolutely, as opposed to try to save. Right, right. And then it's a more rigorous protocol is what you're right. doing. So can and we reasonably accept that higher standard is it's the, the question. way I'm looking at yeah. the question? Yeah. yeah. I'll have to ask you, because I didn't walk each one of these. Yeah, I mean, I tend. Can you ask Brian to mute his end because there's some sound coming through there? Yeah, Brian, would you be able to mute um, some family fun in the background? <laughs> Otherwise, I suspect that's going out to all of Milton. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, go ahead, Cheryl. Well, and I, I thought I'm perhaps that you might need to consult with the landscape architect or the arborist, but if you can answer that tonight, great. Um, mm -hmm. so. I mean... Yeah, I think those were ones, um, I know the 24-inch oak that's between building two and three, uh, the reason why those, you know, we were looking, uh, the 28 is close to the drainage, so right. that one's a little questionable. The other one, like you said, uh, is potential to be saved. I believe that one, ha it, it's going to be like a field condition. It was bent a little bit, so it depends on how that kind of uh, plays out once it's exposed from the uh, surrounding All right, well, how vegetation. about a fourth color between the cyan and <laughs> the magenta that <laughs> gives it a higher, love, a higher standard than high risk? Because the high risk ones seem to me, you know, uh, when I, I read it. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll support um, uh, shifting. I'm going to go back to your 12, 13. Uh, we'll retain the, the, the 14 inch, um, but not, we'll, keep, we'll change that to blue. Okay. Uh, we'll change the two at the end of 13, at the end of 12, the 18 oak and the 15 maple to blue. Great, right, right. Um, And we'll change the two between three, two and three to blue. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'll. Both of them are just the 24 inch? I'll commit to both of them. Okay, they great. have to come back to the planning board if okay. and when and, and have a good cause. Uh, changes in the plan require return to the planning board. Mm -hmm. This will put the onus on us to decide whether we really want to come back or <laughs> prefer to take an extra measure to save the tree. Great. How's that? Great. The, Perfect. Thank just, you. Great. The, the 20 Can I ask a question on the trees as well? Hang on, Brian. Mike first, then you. <laughs> okay, no problem. Sorry, Sorry Brian. <laughs> Stay on vacation there. <laughs> the the twenty eight inch oak between two and three, you commented the drain. I mean it'd be very easy to move the drain. Right. I mean the, the the manhole can stay where it is, the the uh, head wall can stay where it is, and you can you know you can put a twenty two degree bend or something. It'd be, I mean it wouldn't be very costly at all just to move it over. Right. right. And that, that's that, that's the, the uh, sir, that's exactly what I'm saying. Is a field condition. Look at the tree and see if we can wiggle it around. You just have to let the people know in the field that we want to but identify them and we want to try to save them. We have this script. This will require certain protection measures in the field um, prior to you know commencement of construction, um, which is what we've learned to do elsewhere. So, is it um, your intention to flag these trees at some point in the near future so that mm -hmm. they're marked? They're probably marked already. Uh, I don't think we flagged them. Okay. Not all of them. Right. But they would they'd be identified as part of the uh, site layout 
pre-construction state, right? So it, it, just, it just gets simple. I mean, you send a guy out there to do work, and if he isn't highly aware of the fact that these want to be saved, then he's going to say, get it out of the way. Right. <laughs> Brian, your turn. I just want to um, clarify, I'm looking for the landscape plan, but I don't have it in front of me, that the um, proposed natural basin area that uh, outside of the character defining trees, that, that area is going to be essentially uh, cleared out and then new uh, tree species and, and uh, natural species are going to be re infilled there, but that it's not going to be left in its current natural condition, which is quite overgrown and has a substantial amount of uh, dead trees in it. Are you talking about the center of the parcel? Um no, I'm sorry. The natural basin. Uh, um, let me re it's, it's just around, basically the buffer area around the perimeter of the site, especially along Brushel Road. You're talking Especially about adjacent to that buffer zone or within the buffer zone, Brian? Within the buffer zone. Within so the buffer zone. Okay. All along the perimeter of the site. Currently, as you uh, walk along from the front of the site along the stone wall, mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of dead growth in there, uh, dead trees in there, and a substantial amount of under under growth. It's very overgrown and just doesn't look pleasant. I'm just trying to confirm that I'm not landscape in front of me that that is going to be cleaned up. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Cheryl, you had a question? Um, just a couple more comments. This was on the tree preservation and protection plan, um, which thank you for providing. Um, um, sorry, under section three, if there's not a page number in it. Um, for the board, I guess, I'm wondering whether um, we should, is there an opportunity for staff to review location of the fencing um, during construction? Staff review? I mean, I don't know that planning it's- Planning staff or building staff? Planning, which is planning staff is what I was thinking, because I'm not sure this, the fencing arises to the board members taking a look at, but I'm wondering. You're under section, just to clarify, you're under section, section three, three, three products the third and materials. Bullet. Okay, so fencing, it starts fencing used for tree protection to mark the limit of construction disturbance. I would assume that the building inspector would be checking this as part of his regular review of the site, but so are you asking that you want planning staff to also? It, it can well, be provided that they yeah. do it. Well, I'm just thinking that, um, mm -hmm. you know, we're, these trees, character we defining make, trees. We could provide that you <laughs> could do it. <laughs> uh, no, I wasn't looking to volunteer to, for I that. think to answer your question, yes, we could provide that. If we, if the board decides that okay. that's what we want All to right, do, so we, we could provide that, that as a condition, right. yes. Do you want me to leave the office? <laughs> Field trip. Nice. <laughs> uh, then under four, the execution and the protection. Uh, I saw that in the um, in the construction management that there's a, a reference to the site clearing. Is, is that going to be on a phase by phase plan, the limits of clearing? Because we only have it for the whole project, yes. right? Yep. Yes. So each phase will have its own limits of clearing yes. on the drawing. Great. I just wanted to clarify that. Um, and then the next page, fourth bullet down. Um, just read the first three. Four oh, uh, it is recognized that certain specimen trees. Um, in terms of being high risk or to be saved, um, it's it's, re it's not really um, state as determined by whom. I don't think you would mind adding as determined by the arborist. Okay, because we so it's not the excavator who decides that that tree is in his way. <laughs> I've seen it happen. <laughs> so uh, the answer is that. Um, you know, in, in um, another tool that we've used, some municipalities have a tree warden, mm -hmm. and a tree warden is, is, in a sense, designated within something like this to be, if you will, the arbiter of the, a kind of thing that, that there's a, a consultancy uh, with a tree warden. And I don't know if the planning board or the building department want to uh, uh, encumber the tree warden with that responsibility or duty or can um, or, if, um, or if you guys want to so it can be the arborist 
from the building inspector who is the zoning enforcement officer of the special permit or uh, in one other municipality we had a two warden with the sort of the de designated tree protection sort of uh, official or you know site inspection for clearing site inspection for tree protection site you know, yes that really is dead disease dying and ought to be removed or ought not to be I mean, I think uh, elsewhere in here, it's determined by your arborist, which, yeah. I, yeah. which I think yeah. is fine. And okay. I, for consistency, I just thought would, you might want to sure. put so it like in this paragraph. That, and that paragraph amended to, um, to such that uh, in, in the determination of the, of the project arborist. Yeah, because it's as it says, some trees prove quite tolerant of heavy construction activities, some don't, you know. Um, and I was thinking in particular before we move so many from uh, magenta to cyan. But I'm just trying to get us to the place of keeping as many of the trees as we can and trying to find the places that help us do that. That's all. Um, so that's that on that. And then on, uh, Emily, yep. um, on the construction management and phasing plan. Um, question Do we have um, standard hours of operation for construction activities on sites? Yes, in town, there are. So six p six p.m. is within that standard. So I'm looking at work hours under initial construction activities, which is the second page. Seven a.m. It allows to 6 seven a.m. to six p.m. Uh, on weekdays and Saturdays from seven to three. And I'm just wondering if if that's consistent with what's been done el elsewhere. We haven't always required a construction management plan. I think the last one was for 36 Central Avenue. Bill, do you remember in the construction management plan? We didn't have We didn't hours require one for that. We didn't require one? No. There was one where we talked about it, and I thought we had required it. Maybe it wasn't that I, one. This is the first okay. special permit that I've been involved with where there's been discussion of a construction management plan. Mm -hmm. well, I drafted this, and I lifted it from another document, and frankly, didn't mean Look at that, this being a residential neighborhood at the end, I think that's a little long. Mm -hmm. It starts early and it's a long day. Um, uh, and and you know, that should get back to five. Yeah, I think that. Something like that. Okay. Especially, uh, you know, you talk later, uh, and I noted this, about um, leaving the site prior to rush hour. And right. 6 p.m. would be uh, right at rush no. hour here. <laughs> So 4.30 or 5 would be a much better choice at that point. 4.30 would be nice. Yeah, 4.30 is good. It's surprising how, how early rush hour picks up. 4.30 right. is fine. Okay, okay. great. Great. Um, let me see. I think there was one other comment on this. Um, yeah, I think Since you, we have a construction management plan, there's no, there are, in my experience, sometimes dust control provisions, which I didn't see in here. Could we add some provisions for dust control? Dust control, um, well, this site will need a, a SWIP through EPA, okay. uh, which is the Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan, which this, this is framework for. And as you asked for phasing each section, I'll be working with that and developing that in that document as well. And they, they do require dust control. Okay. So. I think there was some discussion of dust control in the project management plan that it, you put together yeah, as well. Yeah, the, in, in the drainage, the, uh, or engine, excuse me, engineering, engineering report, report, there's and a um, construction phase yeah. operation and maintenance plan, which is my framework for building the uh, SWIFT, or stormwater pollution prevention plan okay. required. And there is dust uh, okay. prevention we, there. We will add it to this, because candidly, this, is, this document is a little easier to hand to a contractor right. and have them right. read than a set of this. Um, so as a project manager, man, manual, this, this is more efficient and from a practical standpoint. So I think your comment is it's a good catch and we'll list it from where we have elsewhere or where we would put it in the slip and put it in this. Okay, great. That's it. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Mike, any further questions? Alex? Uh, No, I, I haven't. Uh, I, I'm just wondering about the form of the permit. We have these two agreements which seem to be separate, but I think that they have should be part of the permit. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
we have to take a look at them and make sure that they are have the necessary teeth to uh, make sure they're enforceable. But I, I think that, you know, I'm impressed with the, uh, with the thoroughness of the, uh, with what has been provided. This thing, as far as, uh, if you've seen this, as far as uh, the uh, working this into the phasing, in the permit, uh, it can be done. I think it is a little. Uh, uh, it's it's pretty good. It's pretty good. All, all in all, I think that uh, uh, we're there. The only the only thing that I really am still somewhat concerned about is the amount of fill that's being brought in uh, and the 600 dump trucks full of fill. Uh, and I don't, you know, if if the neighborhood had been around to uh, uh, make an opinion known, I'd I'd, I'd listen to that opinion. But uh, uh, I haven't. Uh, I mean, the idea of sending them down uh, 138 and uh, and then one down Neponset Valley and the next one down Bradley or something like that. Uh, might be okay. I, I mean, it's a lot of trucks and they, they really should be, uh, they, they should be uh, non-rush hour trucks and uh, they should be, uh, probably shouldn't all arrive at once. Fair enough. Um, in any event, I, I, I think that all this is, uh, uh, I, I think that we've got all we need to do the, uh, except maybe for the, uh, the drainage, the, uh, um, we need to button down. We need the final stamp of approval on the drainage. And Bill is here. Bill is here, Why yes. Come on come up, Bill. Up, Bill? We had a question for you on who was doing what on the drainage as far as is John Thompson taking over the final review? Yes. Is our peer reviewer looking at it? What's, what's happening? Um, the comments actually went to, Nish gave the initial comments. We sent those back to, uh, to Deb. Deb came back and gave, the, um, gave her responses. I gave those responses to John Thompson. John Thompson is reviewing those. Uh, he had no issues with any of the issues. He felt that they had all been addressed. He could not have a letter ready for today due to the projects he's already involved in this week. He will have it by the beginning of the week. Yeah. Did, did the peer reviewer sign off on the changes or, or on the, uh, the... John would sign off on them. Can't, can't why, why didn't we ask the peer reviewer to sign off on them? Just an extra step that... We were making sure I mean, that they were their their comment. Okay, I, I, I mean, mean it, it does seem to me if you have a peer reviewer, the peer reviewer should follow through to the bitter end. Uh, well, I think the issues that they brought up were ones that um, the main issues were a T that John actually asked for. Uh, the the rainfall data was one of. Uh, he was asking for Cornell, and um, Deb and John used a different one. Um, there was a third one that uh, what was the third. The, the soil soil type. The soil yeah, evaluation. the soil types and um, Deb changed the soil types from A to B, mm -hmm. which changed the design a little bit anyways, and it added in an extra uh, an extra two four foot lines within the collection system. Um, they're all things that were suggested in the comments from Niche and the things that John picked up on and said, you know, he agreed with them already. So it, is, there, is there any downside? I mean, I think all the answers are answered. All the questions right, are answered. Right, and that's what John said. I mean, thought. but can't we just, but sometimes somebody asks a question and I might interpret it as answered and you say, well, well that, that would, actually, that was not the intent of what I was looking for, but I don't believe there's much there, but what would be the harm of sending the responses to Niche? I mean, I, I would think their re-review would be extremely brief. 
but it would just be nice to hear them say, yes, they responded to our questions, thank you, and we're, we're, we're happy with the response, or we're accepting of the response. And then John could say, I agree with this, and he wouldn't have to write his letter. Uh, but I, I, I expect that the drainage will be approved. Mm -hmm. uh, we just want to make sure that the eyes are well, we do it because drainage is, drainage is important. We don't want people complaining down the road that we cut corners. But I, I do think that we can proceed. I, I mean, from what Bill says, uh, we can, can proceed on the assumption that we will get clearance for this. All right. Can, so can, I've without saying, can yeah. we still send these responses to Mitch? Fine. Just, and I, again, I think it'll be very brief, but again, it would be nice to have the source of the question. Just send them the yep, notes. I will. All right, so I've checked in with each of you to make sure there are no more questions. Brian, any more questions before we move to public comment? I have no questions. I just want to uh, congratulate the applicant for a very thorough application and its willingness to um, discuss things with the board and respond in a timely manner. So thank you very much for that. Just the last comment. Yes. Uh -huh. Because I think the drainage was significant to the uh, abutters, so I think that's very good that we're addressing that. But as well, to me, it's the, uh, and I know it's not a, a prolonged thing, but it's scheduled, is the construction period is going to be somewhat imposing on the neighbors. So I just, I'd like to find out that we can write into the permit that the, the trucks that are delivering the borrowed material will not queue up on uh, question of road. And, and that's relative to you, you're going to have to clear enough space to either stockpile it on site or. But we're going to have the road done first, so the internal road system done first. It's just it's going to be a vicious cycle. I mean, you're going to have to clear it to get it in, right. you're going to be a get it in, and <laughs> these trucks start coming, they start, you'll have 15 of them queued up on Brush Hill Road at 7 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah. And I think, to, I just want to comment to that point, I think um, also uh, the 7 a.m., uh, in light of what Mike said in terms of the duration of construction overall, is to think about the truck activity at 7 a.m. for three years. You know, the neighbors, it would be a lot. So if, in terms of the construction management uh, plan, I think to try and uh, schedule that so it comes a bit later than 7 a.m. The heavy construction. Right, uh, the heavy construction. Yeah. These cool. guys with these the trucks vehicles. are trying to make rounds. Yeah. They're trying to get back to the area that they pick up, they borrow, and get it here, and go back and get another one. Get. So would it be helpful? Excuse me. So you don't, you don't want them, like I say, they'd be happy to be sitting there at 7 o'clock in the morning waiting for you to open the gate to the site so they can come in and dump. Understood. So would it be... Um, would it be helpful or comforting to the board to uh, weave into the construction management plan under the work hours paragraph or construction project construction control is somewhere in this document this notion of um, the timeliness and or the, and the queuing mm -hmm. of trucks such that you didn't have them you know lined up at six. 45, uh, at, at, I believe you're in the construction business, so we've had more than one occasion where the, the guys will show up at 5.30 and start the bulldozer and sit there letting it run <laughs> until 6.30 and, <laughs> and, and finish their coffee till 7, where the intent is that they really shouldn't start it till 7 or 5. Um, but that, that's a rule that we can, uh, I, I think we can appropriately encapsulate this concern into this document which to uh, Alex's uh, point earlier uh, we, have, we have deliberately at this point left a, an exhibit blank blank uh, at the top of it so that when the special permit is drafted there's a reference to exhibit ABC or 123 or whatever that is part of the permit it is a part of the project requirements, it goes into the Registry of Deeds, it goes into the tree preservation, lives with the project, as you saw, and is a burden not only during the construction phase, but uh, for, the, for the life of the, the community. So if, if that, that seems like a reasonable way to address that concern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was going to make the same comment. This, we've intentionally done that, and I have uh, 
I know a couple of weeks ago I submitted a draft of a proposed special permit. I have a red line which has incorporated a lot of the additional specific um, comments that came out of the last meeting and the new newer sets of plans. I do provide for four exhibits, uh, including Exhibit B, tree, tree Preservation Plan, and Exhibit C, Construction Management Phasing Plan. So they are intended to be incorporated as exhibits attached and incorporated into the document. So, so I think what we'll do is we'll take public comments now, and then we'll come back, and as part of discussing the next steps, we'll also discuss a little bit that draft document okay. as well. So if you three will sit back, I'll read the rules for the public testimony. Um, please wait to be recognized before speaking. Come to the table and give your name and address. Speak into the microphone. When you are done, please leave the table. All questions or comments must be directed to the chair. Speakers may not cross-examine applicants, board members, or other speakers. And as we did with the previous public hearing, because we do have three hearings tonight, um, we're asking that people only speak once. So, who would like to speak to the board? Yes, sir, please come forward. Good evening. Um, Tim Kernan, 642 Brush Hill Road, and president of the Brush Hill Area Neighborhood Association. Um, I, too, uh, appreciate all the detail that the board and the, and the developer is putting into this project. Um, a couple of things come to mind. One is um, I'd like some clarification on the 600 truckloads. Is that going to be scattered over three years? In other words, is the site going to be totally prepared and these 600 trucks are going to be coming? If we just shed some light on that schedule, that would be, that would be good. Uh, relative to 7 o'clock in the morning, uh, my understanding is that landscaping crews, for example, can't start uh, until 7.30. So maybe there could be some clarification on there. Um, uh, I've, I've seen landscaping crews come in and just idle their trucks uh, at 7 o'clock in the morning until they can actually start up at 7.30, and that sort of gets frustrating. And I anticipate that um, the neighbors in that area would uh, um, like the same, same sort of courtesy. Um, the, the other concern I would really like to address, which I don't know has been addressed tonight, and that is the entrance. Um, it was a topic of my presentation to the board a couple of weeks ago, and I regret that I wasn't here last time. Uh, my apologies. Um, I, <clears throat> I would like to see some sort of minimal low impact design, and am happy to suggest to the board, as I think I did last time, that their final decision on the, on the design of that entrance could be delayed for a period of time so that the developer can actually get started. I don't want to hold them up, but I do think that entrance needs to be designed with some consideration of the, of the scenic quality of Brush Hill Road and, and, and how it's going to be maintained. The concept that sidewalks are going to be eventuality on Brush Hill Road, I don't think should factor into any of the considerations here. Um, sidewalks on Brush Hill Road is a, is a, is a big topic. Um, and there's, uh, this is not the time to address that nor to anticipate that eventuality. Um, so the Neighborhood Association would like to see uh, as, as minimal impact as possible, no curbing, um, and I'm happy to work with the developer over the course of time and the board over the course of time to figure that out. In the letter that I left at two meetings ago, I showed you some pictures of various entryways, one of which was the Milton Healthcare uh, at what I remember is Flatley Field, but it may not be the correct name anymore. Anyone? No one? All right, well, in that case, you can. Yeah, oh, there you are. Please, sir, come forward. I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Kyle Payne. I'm an attorney in Newton. My address is 373 Boyle Street, 02459. Last week, you were kind enough to indulge a letter that I wrote. I briefly wanted to submit a follow-up that I lately submitted e uh, via email to you tonight. My apologies for that. I'm going to be very brief and just say that the content of the letter indicates uh, that we think this is too big a proposal, especially considering 36 units in an area zoned for only six. Additionally, you asked for some, uh, there were some comments that I followed up with about case law and some other items, in particular that spot zoning is unconstitutional and uh, violations of the bylaws and some of the other items, they're all addressed therein. So I thank you. 
Thank you very much. Anyone else? All right, if you'd like to come forward and address the questions that we received. So it's the truck, the lo truckloads, the number and the phasing, uh, the start for landscaping crews being 7.30. Is that something that is consistent? And we may have staff answer that as well. The impact, uh, low impact design entrance and, Uh, I'll, and obviously the, the yeah, I'll jump in. This is Jack Dolly. I'm the developer. Um, I'm not familiar with the landscaping start rule of 7:30. Um, thank you. Uh, I I can certainly incorporate that provision from a heavy equipment uh, perspective. But if I have a you know a tile contractor coming in to want to do interior tile work um, in a, in a home and not not particularly noisy. Um, uh, I suppose if he's sawing tile outside, it could be considered noisy. Uh, but um, I, I, I'm willing to impose a covenant on ourselves of 730 for this sort of heavy equipment, particularly noisy uh, uh, activity as it relates to impact to the neighborhood. Which I think is very generous for you to start at 7.30, but so you'll say that uh, no heavy equipment will start before 7.30 as well, no heavy equipment will arrive on site or in the neighborhood before 7.30? Yep. So uh, we'll redline the document, construction management. You'll have the opportunity to review it before you vote finally, uh, hopefully two, night, two, two weeks from tonight, but it, when? It, as, uh, can I follow up on that? Yes, but then I want to make sure he addresses everything else before we Which ask questions. Which is another questions, thing. So. It would be nice to have the, uh, try to overlay a, a trucking schedule on the schedule that you already gave us for no other reason than it is what it is. The number is the number. But the people in the neighborhood, it would be nice to see, there's going to be a point in time where the trucks are going to have a, a significant impact because there's going to be a lot of them. But it'd be nice to see that it's going to conclude. It'd okay. be nice to the people in the neighborhood to see that, you know, and I'm just throwing, uh, dates, times out there that you start in March, April, by the end of May, it's going to die off. And, and, and everybody, including I'm sure the public, understands a schedule is a, is, a, is a goal, it's an attempt, it's not written in stone, but at least it gives them a, a perspective of what to expect and when to expect it to subside. And okay. Um, I, I guess I want to take a, just make a comment relative to the truck tracking. We, we, we've had a number of meetings here lately, and we've thrown out this notion of 612 trucks or whatever the number is, um, and and this and we've and we're leaving the audience and the and the public and ourselves with the impression that we have 600 trucks showing up within a um, uh, some sort of uh, you know queuing on on the road and 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 so on and so forth and in, in, in mass. Um, if we look at the, the schedule of the cuts and fills and such, the, the majority of, uh, of, of material import is associated with bringing up the road so that the road uh, can appropriately support the utilities and drain, et cetera. As we go from building pod to building pod, um, the numbers vary from um, you know, a couple hundred to a multiple of that. And as the schedulist tries to depict is that we're not clear cutting the site and we're not turning the site into a gravel pit. It'll be a phased construction uh, uh, build out of the site that we will proceed coincidentally from building one around clockwise so that um, after completion of the roadway, and to your point, after a 90 day period of time, um, that truck, truck traffic will be rather episodic. Um, uh, and we'll dig a hole and we'll grade around a hole and then we won't do any truck traffic for some period of time while we're building that particular pod. And then we'll have to come to the next one and, and do whatever work is associated with that. So I, I want to I uh, maybe mute a bit, um, and if I, and maybe, maybe it's too strong a word to spell a bit, um, this, this, uh, you know, this horrific image of, of, um, of, of the big dig uh, on Brush Hill Road, um, and and there is, and, and that's not to minimize that there is activity. There's a fair amount of building and density going to happen on this uh, site, uh, and it will impact uh, the immediate neighborhood. I, I, I don't want to dispute that, but um, and, and, and pretend that it doesn't exist. But I do 
we want to try to put it in perspective of a, a, a several year build out uh, and a phase build out and uh, an understanding on our part and a sensitivity on our part that uh, it is our burden um, to make sure that we don't uh, adversely uh, affect the livelihood and the, and the well-being of, of the immediate neighborhood during the build-out of the project, and we're, we're willing to take and be covenanted um, to that effect um, and, and held accountable. Can I speak to the trucks for just a moment? Yes, you can. Uh, Again, just one. Uh, the applicant, in my opinion, has been uh, pretty uh, willing to hear the board's concerns tonight and respond to them with offers of covenants. I, I just want to speak as a member of, or a resident in that neighborhood. Uh, the, the impact to the neighborhood is is, is going to be finite. I think everybody's admitted that tonight or addressed that tonight. Um, I think the result is one that should be a pretty significant improvement to the condition of that property today and the neighborhood has pretty much uh, pretty much endorsed this project um, even prior to the submission of this application um, you know there's I, I don't think we've heard any comments about the truck traffic except for tonight when the when the uh, when mr. Kernan asked for clarification and I think we've been given some so you know, I'd like to recommend from the board standpoint that you know, we, we, we should accept that the, the concessions are made, the truck traffic is going to happen, but it is going to be finite. Hopefully the result will be a project that everyone will be very happy with. Great. Thank you. Yes, you know, um, still have a few more things to address. <laughs> yep. I, I, I just want to maybe, maybe yeah. add to this conversation yeah. and, and um, the, this board, um, no, it's a, different board. a different board, excuse me, at, on, a, on a different case. Um, in dealing with Phil, in which a swimming pool was it was uh, was going to be built, and approximately 3,000 plus cubic yards of material were associated, um, coveted that that activity with a provision where quote all deliveries of such fill should only occur on weekdays and only between the hours of 9 a.m. and 3 p.m. I'll lift that language and add it to this mm -hmm. construction management plan, um, uh, which will be a permit uh, a condition of permit for this project. That was a, yeah, that's a special that. permit. Last point there. Yeah. It, it, oh, that's good. I just want to make sure he's done. That, yeah. Yes. Go ahead. You know, I, I, I think this, 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 uh, your plan is great. And I, and I think the neighborhood uh, apparently echoes that. But uh, it's just we're trying to highlight any significant things that could potentially look bad. I mean, it, it, I, that, I guess I feel is that it's our obligation as the planning board to look out for things that the public will say, well, wh why didn't you guys look out for us? <laughs> you know, we thought it was a great plan until this happened. Didn't you know this kind of thing would happen? You guys are supposed to look out for these things. And but to, to that point, I just, and I'm not trying to make the life difficult, but well, you have a wheel wash because as discussion goes on, that's the first thing I see at the construction site, you bring in uh, trailer dumps, and the next thing you know, you have mud halfway down the street and people are like, where's the mud coming from? Where do you think it's coming from? Well, so, you know, a wheel wash and maybe the comment that if things should get significant out on Brush Hill Road that you'd bring in a, a street sweep. And if you had the wheel wash set up, you probably never needed it, never even needed it. And, actually, and to Mike's point, and I think this is an important thing that you put in your construction management plan, and I want to call it out for people who are listening in is that you will have an on-site representative, um, an owner's representative, that will be the liaison with the town. And I would just suggest, as has been done in the past with um, another project in town, is to make sure that the planning office has that name and contact information so that people uh, who have questions are able to get in touch with the owner's representative. Uh, but that's fantastic that you will have that. I think uh, we all wish more projects would have uh, such transparency on that. To make it easier. I think the last thing out here is the entrance, the design of the entrance that was asked tonight. I, uh, my understanding, I think the, the project team is very happy with the site entrance as it was proposed. It, it, it responds to the historic nature of the presentation on Brush Hill Road. It responds also to concerns about um, possible bus stops and pedestrian access. I know Alex 
has expressed direct concern about sidewalk access. And I'm not sure that unless somebody else presents a design, we ought not to be chasing a design effort on something that we're pretty satisfied with and we think works. Um, if the board has specific different ideas about how to adjust it and would like us to evaluate that, I think that would be an appropriate way to do it. But I, but I think the notion of so then I think design. that becomes part of the board's deliberations once we close the public hearing as to how we want to address that. So whether we want to make changes as requested or um, keep it as it is or some sort of discussion in between that. So, so then the process would be, uh, since there's no more comment from the public, if the board is satisfied that they have received uh, <coughs> sufficient information to begin our deliberations, then I would recommend that we close the public hearing at this point. Uh, we do have a draft special permit, and uh, which was very helpful to have. Uh, I'd be looking for a volunteer, since uh, Tim and I are working on Thayer, I'd be looking for a volunteer from the board to go through that and sort of take responsibility for walking through that. Um, you wanted to talk a little bit, I think, Ned, about your red line. So let's do that before we close the public hearing, and then we'll go from there. Okay. And I don't know whether you got the red lines today. I don't think I they've been printed out yet. They haven't been, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't I have, I brought copies just. Fantastic. <coughs> I, think, I think we agreed that you would bring copies. I would bring so. copies, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so Done. <laughs> okay, keep going. I'll volunteer unless someone else wants to do it. I think oh. that would be great, oh, um, Alex. Yeah. I, have, you have a red I think Alex will recognize the language. I have an extra one. I was hoping that the attorney oh. here would volunteer. Attorney's love to read that. Really. That would be great. Um, I think Alex will recognize the form and recognize the language. Uh, this is, I started with the site special permit and the site plan that was approved for 2 Adam Street, mm -hmm. which is the most detailed and most significant building special permit that I've been involved with. I've been involved in a number of special permit types, and it, and it really talks about enforceability and enforcement, incorporation to all the site uh, planning. I've identified, I think, all of the specific sheets okay. uh, and the, um, uh, the other, the two written plans that are identified as exhibits. I also have an exhibit uh, for the Exterior material and production specification. We did have a brief discussion about the exterior materials, yes. um, and so that's that would be incorporated as an exhibit. Um, the, the the red line. Some of its type of is just stylistic correction. Um, a, a, a modified with respect to the authorized development of buildings. We would say that there's the renovation of the Dupee House. That there are developments of um, <coughs> two uh, unit townhouses. Mm -hmm. Certain of the of the build building pods are rec identified as having two units. Others have three units. Um, and so, paragraph two deals with the two units. Paragraph three deals with the three units. Um, and f paragraph four identifies the male building. Um, I do say, modified to say, that the mail building will be sited so that its entry is not visible from the Brush Hill Road and that there will be plantings such as trellises, vines, or other to shield it or mask its appearance. Not to rush you, but we are half an hour late starting our third uh, public okay. hearing, so I just wanted to make you aware of that. Well, well <laughs> that's fine. I, think I can see some that. people patiently waiting in the back there. Uh, well, Alex and I can go through it. Okay. I, 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 I want to thank the board. I encourage the board to it's time to close the public hearing um, and get into the review of the draft and hopefully two weeks from now we'll be in a position where we can present a final form and the board can vote. Okay, fantastic. So do I have a motion to close the public hearing? Not for me. <laughs> do we have a second? All right. We moved I have and seconded. a discussion. Do you have a discussion? I do. It okay. seems to me we should. There's, uh, I happy with the timetable. Let's see if we can't do this by uh, next week. But if we're getting, you know, potentially some stuff in the drains, it, it doesn't make any, it, closing it tonight or closing it 10 minutes into next, next the next meeting is, uh, 
is exactly the same. And uh, um, procedurally, uh, um, I mean, if John Thompson says, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, um, and we've closed the public hearing, um, so you want it's to just non, a non-elegant way of doing it. It seems to me that uh, it, we can close the public hearing in two weeks, and uh, it's not going to impact anyone. I'm going to review this, and, and we're going to have something ready to go in two weeks. So unless unless the drainage people, you know, blow it up. So your preference, just to clarify for everybody, is that we keep the public hearing open till the 23rd so right. as to receive the drainage information. At that point, if there's no major changes, which we're not expecting. How, how about keeping it only solely for the purpose of re receiving the drainage stuff? Then if the public hearing's open, we have to allow public comment. So not just, necessarily. Saying. Not if we keep it open public. solely for 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 receipt of the, uh, but I know Tim might come in with a, a brilliant plan of uh, for the entrance. We'll give him two give him two weeks. All right. So there's motion made and seconded on the table. Do you have any comment on keeping the public hearing open for the purpose of receiving the drainage? Just to give you the chance to respond that? to that. <laughs> Um, Before we take our vote? Well, I, I, I guess my point of view is we've been, um, I believe that this has been thoroughly looked at. I believe uh, that Niche had re re produced a report which has been responded to by our engineer has, and there, that has been assessed by both planning staff and municipal authorities who guided us in the de design development of the site. And based upon what I understand, they uh, are comfortable with it. Uh, I'd rather see tonight's meeting closed uh, and that um, subject to the receipt of a final sign, you know, report, written report by the DPW in order for you to, to make your, your report. All right. Any further discussion from board members? All right. All those in favor? Were, of I'm sorry, Emily. Yes, Brian. Just repeat, can you just re re repeat the motion one more time? There's a lot of discussion. The motion, the current motion is to close the public hearing. Thank you. Anything else? All right. All those in favor of closing the public hearing, aye. 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 So that's three against. Okay. That's one against abstentions. I'm going to abstain. All right. So the public hearing is closed. We will have our deliberations on July 23rd. Let's uh, schedule a we don't really have to schedule it, but let's throw it on for 7.30. And we'll go from there. Thank you. Thank you all Thank very you. much. All right, next item I, on the we, agenda. I, yes. I you on, on what you just said? Yes. Um, what do you have on before that? We have at 7.15, we've got 3.33 Brushville Road. Okay. So. What, what, what is it that we're doing at... 7.30, we're doing the deliberations on this, just to give anybody who wants to listen to the deliberations a time to show up. All right, next item on the agenda is a preliminary subdivision application for 41 Pleasant Street. We ask that um, the applicant move up to talk to us on this. I'm going to read out. So this is a, a preliminary subdivision plan. We are not required to hold a public hearing for a preliminary subdivision plan, but we're going to treat it as though we're a public hearing so as to get public comment on it. So we'll have a quick update from staff, then we're going to ask the applicant to make a presentation to us. The board will ask questions, and we'll look for public comment, <coughs> and after that we'll decide our next steps. So, Tim, anything we should know before the applicant begins their presentation? Uh, Bill handled most of this technical review. I, um, 41 Pleasant Street is uh, shorthand. This is actually 33 and 41 Pleasant Street. Um, they're neighboring parcels. Okay. Um, but we, we want to call it 41 Pleasant Street. Um, I'm going to pass it off to Bill. Bill, on you go. Yep. <clears throat> turn this prank and see the picture. Sorry, Brian. Uh, this is the second rendition of plans. The first one you got uh, in May. These are the latest ones. Um, what we made them do is come back and make sure that we put on uh, all, of the, all of the abutting houses, uh, put in the names for the abutting houses. We actually just went through a checklist of everything that is within the rules and regs. Um, 
they came back with a second plan. It does have all of the issues that are in there. It also actually has a few things that, uh, some changes that were put in there by the engineering department. Um, there's also one for the fire department that fire hydrant is across the street. There's now a fire hydrant in the middle of the road. There's also one at the end. Um, they're going to actually bring the water line out to the edge of the property. Um, that is about the only ones that we actually had. We made sure that they check every line of the rules and regulations. Excellent. And they've addressed them. Great. In that case, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. Please introduce yourself and welcome. Good evening, Hop. My name is Paul Sullivan, uh, 21 Smith Road, project consultant, and uh, yeah, developer is here, Rob Celebrity, and uh, thank you. Um, as uh, Bill was saying, we uh, made a few changes that uh, Joe Lynch and uh, John Thompson requested. Uh, <laughs> I guess the major one was the easement that was added to the end of the cul-de-sac. And uh, it actually runs through the edge of the whirlpool 100 foot no disturb area. So we requested to be on before the Conservation Commission next week to have a, an informal discussion with them about it, to get some feedback from them uh, about their concerns for that. Uh, if need be, we could move it further north. Uh, it, it really shrinks the building envelope of lot four, but uh, it still could be done. Uh, we've set the easement up as 15 feet wide versus 20 feet, which is typically what the town requires. So we were going to ask for some waiver on that. But uh, to go back from the beginning, the, the property is uh, located at uh, 33 and 41 Pleasant Street. It uh, the site is located between Randolph Avenue and Quarry Lane. Uh, there's two uh, residence uh, zonings there, B and C. The front portion of the property is uh, all C zoning, which is the small lots here. It's 7,500 is required. Most of the lots are over 8,000 square feet. And then the two rail lots are... Uh, Brian, could you mute, please? And resident B, which requires 20,000 square feet. Uh, the sewer and water are coming <coughs> off of Pleasant Street, tying into the existing mains. And uh, the sewer runs up the center point of the roadway with the water 10 feet away from that. Um, we proposed uh, eight lots, nine lots in total, eight off of the roadway. And uh, six of them will be in residence C, and two of them will be in residence B. And then lot nine fronts on existing 33 foot uh, right of way. It's an unapproved uh, right of way. So uh, uh, we're going to leave that for a future date to determine uh, if, the, if the right of way can be improved to create frontage for that lot. Um, as Bill had mentioned earlier, uh, Bill, uh, Director Lynch had requested that we add a second hydrant at the end of the easement, which is right there, and the, uh, relocate the existing hydrant we had proposed to uh, more the center point of the subdivision road. The, uh, we're also proposing to have underground electric service and natural gas main installed for the future homes. And uh, the applicant will be seeking some waivers from the rules and regulations. Uh, because of the, uh, the way the road ties into the existing road, it's, it's not a right angle as is uh, typically required for a new ro roadway. Um, it's, it's less than 90 degrees, or greater than 90 degrees. We're proposing a 40-foot right-of-way versus a 50-foot, which is required. Uh, typically required for roadway. We're asking for a 10-foot reduction. 
Most of the right-of-ways in the area, in the neighborhood, are 40-foot right-of-ways. Um, uh, we're asking for a waiver of the granite curbing requirement and replace it with Cape Cod berm. And then uh, instead of putting two sidewalks in the development, we're uh, proposing to put a single sidewalk that wraps around the cul-de-sac. <coughs> And uh, the stormwater is still uh, in flux. It's still being uh, engineered. It's probably going to be another week or so before the stormwater plan comes together. Uh, but we do intend to tie into the existing stormwater system that's located in Pleasant Street. And that's about it, I guess. Mike, right, look through your papers Questions and see if you have an extra members? application. For this? For this, because I, I don't know. I, until my the application of the plan. I've got a big one. I can uh -huh. pull out for you. No extra. Nope. No. I didn't, I didn't get one. Okay. I got one and I brought it, but I don't know where it is. Hmm. I just realized it. Well, then if you can look at the big I, one, you can slide mine back. He's offering a big one. <laughs> he's offering a. Yeah. Something, uh. Thank you. All right. You're very welcome. So, again, questions from board members? Well, lot nine has no frontage, so it has to be, it isn't a lot, or it, it, it can't be lot nine. It has to be not a buildable lot. Uh, so we have, uh, we have that. And I'm, I'm interested in hearing from uh, whether or not anyone in the neighborhood has any issues because obviously this plan depends on a waiver of the uh, roadway entering the entering Pleasant Street at a 90 degree angle. And uh, so the waiver is uh, contingent on basically uh, the board saying this is a good plan, people in the neighborhood saying this is a good plan, we're, uh, uh, we're for it. So uh, that's what I would like to find out, if that's what they have to say. Great. We will have public comments soon. Any other questions? Brian, anything at your end? Uh, no, the only thing that's jumping out at me, and it, uh, frankly, it's jumped out on most of the applications I haven't. Uh, raised it before, but I, I am noticing that um, most of our applications are seeking waivers away from vertical granite curbing and proposing Cape Cod berm. Uh, I, I, I mentioned, I, I think I know where DPW stands on this, but I'd be interested in hearing about it. Uh, certainly, vertical granite curbing is a um, desirable condition, uh, but I, there, are, there are certainly DPW reasons for not having it. Um, you know, my experience is Cape Cod Road is a lot less durable, but I'm interested in hearing DPW's comment about that as part of the application. Okay, great. Cheryl, anything at your end? Um, just um, to relate to what Brian said is uh, in terms of the stormwater management, uh, the curbing, you know, does serve a role in that regard. So I would like to understand um, how those two are going to relate when we see the stormwater plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mike, anything at your end? No, I'm just seeing the, this plan now. I'm just wondering, as Charles asked that, I'm wondering, oh, there's a catch basin. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was wondering. Okay. Sorry, you comment? The, the, um, the hydrants issue was one that the original hydrant was across the street and at the end of the cul de sac. Mm -hmm. The one being across the street would have been the first one to be hit. Therefore, it would have closed down Pleasant Street, which is why the fire chief wanted it brought in off of Pleasant. They pull in, they can grab in the middle of the street. They go either way. Um, that was the hydrant issue. The, um, the curbing issue was one that, when I saw it, my question came back to, to Paul was, is this ever going to be a public way? And if it's ever going to be a public way, um, then it becomes part of the issue for your waivers. If this is not going to be a public way, will never be a public way, um, 
the, the issue of the vertical curbing comes into play when it's a public way that we have to plow. Mm -hmm. If it's a road that we don't have to plow, our plows aren't going to tear up that Cape Cod berm because that's what happens is our plows tear it up, which is why we don't want it. Um, we don't want to put back Cape Cod berm. That's a question for you to answer. Are you considering that this would be a public way or keep it as a private but Of course, way? even if it's a private way, we don't want the Cape Cod berm torn up. We want this street maintained properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, if plows have a tendency to tear up Cape Cod burns, that's a good reason not to have a Cape Cod burn. True. So are you considering that it would be a public or a private way, or have you not decided yet? Uh, the applicant is uh, leaning towards having a private way. That's, okay. that, that's like the way he's going to go with it. All right. The, the, the other uh, issue that we should mention is that when we have a standard for a 50-foot right-of-way, there is no, I mean, there's room here for a 50-foot way, and giving a waiver for no reason other than the fact that they want a 40-foot way basically establishes uh, uh, a precedent that a 40-foot way is now the standard in the, uh, in the town of Milton. It's a good point, too, when you do the full application, uh, when you request a waiver to provide a reason for the waiver as well so that we can understand your thinking behind it and make our judgment. Anything? Believe, yeah, if I could just yeah, answer quickly on that. I, I believe uh, Pleasant Street is a 40-foot right of way, and it just seemed in keeping with the neighborhood mm -hmm. and the existing conditions. That's, but we'll uh, we'll uh, a better explanation for it. Okay. Anything else? Yeah? Who's going to plow it? If it's a private way, yeah, I assume. Yeah. The Homeowners Association. I just wanted you to say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. Okay. Anything else? I think that's yes, an important uh, point, though. And, and, uh, you know, I, I live across from the private way, and I know the fire department's required it to be plowed by the town a number of times because the private way has not been plowed. So uh, it's something that I want to make sure is, is very clear in whatever approvals uh, we need to give. Uh, that this is a private way to be, be plowed by a homeowners association. Okay. Yeah. Question. Yeah. First, Bill, and then you. I have one more, and that's because I heard somebody ask the question earlier today. Um, and I know, noticed that you know, the houses across the street on Pleasant Street are not put on this plan. How do the houses across the street from this roadway, how are they being affected by? the turning movements from this roadway. Are there driveways? Is that what you're asking? Or the house? No, the or houses. Yeah. I mean, if I put a house and I'm you mean headlights? Waiting, I'm waiting at a stop sign to take a right-hand turn because this is a one-way street. As I'm waiting at that stop sign, am I lighting up the house across the street? It's actually uh, the house across the street. It's the garage and the driveway. It's directly across from the, the proposed roadway. But we will add, uh, we'll add those houses and driveways to the plan. Great. Um, but I'm sorry, that just raised another interesting point for me, which is uh, we, we've, been, we've been trying very hard on the Brush Hill Road application to be sensitive to the uh, building side facing Brush Hill Road. It, 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 I know that it appears that both of the uh, buildings that are going to be abutting Pleasant Street, looks like the garage side is going to be actually abutting Pleasant Street. So. It would be uh, good for the board to see, if, if, if possible, what the elevation of that side of the building will look like as, as, it, would be, as it would be viewed from Brussels Street. You beat me to it, Brian. That was my question. So uh, by putting the street in here, you're sort of interrupt, and then turning the houses towards the new street and away from Pleasant, you're interrupting the, uh, the development patterns. So how are you going so to address actually, that? I mean, the footprints we have, we took it from actually one of the houses that we built down in uh, the <coughs> Women's Club. Mm -hmm. But uh, the garages are on the interior. They're not on, they're not on the Pleasant Street side. Okay. Because I know at uh, the Women's Club site, you've got a blank wall facing Reedsdale Road, which is not a condition we'd like to see again. So That was because of just a lot of traffic on Route 28. and. There is. Even with the few windows that are there, there's quite a bit of noise gets in. I am familiar with that noise, but it does uh, interrupt the development pattern, sure. so we don't want to see that. It does, it does show up an evergreen screen. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
be nice. So is there anything else from board members? Yes, Cheryl. Have you met with all of the immediate abutters and the ones across the street on Pleasant Street and reviewed this plan with them? Uh, we've ha had two meetings. We had one meeting at uh, Kelly and Regi uh, in East Milton. That was the first one. The second meeting we had at 41 Pleasant Street. So uh, all the neighbors were able to walk over to the to the site. It was a pretty good turnout for that. That was on the 22nd of, of, uh, of June we had that meeting. So uh, yeah, I'd say most of the neighbors from Pleasant Street and Quarry Lane were there. A good portion of them were there, yeah. And their reaction? Uh, you know, it was... But their concerns seemed to be, uh, a few of them had concerns about density, size of lots, uh, traffic a little bit, uh, screenings, they were hoping for some type of screening, whether plantings or fences, and then uh, ledge removal, some of them were concerned about ledge removal. Anything else? What, what, do you have any uh, geological information? Is it telling you that you're going to have base with you? Yeah, we actually uh, dug test holes in the roadway all the way up to the cul-de-sac, uh, and uh, we hit refusal at a ledge at 10 to 12 feet, so it was pretty far down. So you, gee, so you wouldn't hit it to put it in the base with the house? Either. No. I, the only lot that's probably going to have a uh, problem is definitely is lot four. There's a pretty good outcropping right where the house is. All right. So let's move. Yes. All right, one more, and then let's move to public comment, because uh, um, they've, they've been very patient. I know. On sheet one of three, you actually have the trees on site located. Um, from that point on, those trees disappear. <coughs> Can you, in your preparation of your definitive plan, show us the trees that are staying? Because some of these trees are, you've got a 30 inch tree in front of uh, Lot 7's house, which you can't buy a tree like that. Um, there's the potential that you could get a 55 inch tree on uh, Lot 1, that if you slid the house back a couple of feet, you may be able to save that tree. Um, that, that, there's a few of those trees that are in here. Um, there's a 30-inch tree on lot six that, you know, it's up by the right-of-way, but I don't know that it's staying or that it's going. But it would be nice to know that some of these big trees add to the character of the neighborhood are actually going to get to stay. Sure. Okay. Okay. If nothing else, I'm going to ask the two of you to step back. I'm going to read the rules for public testimony. Wait to be recognized before speaking. Come to the table and give your name and address. Speak into the microphone. <coughs> when you are done, please leave the table. All questions or comments must be directed to the chair. Speakers may not cross-examine applicant, board members, or other speakers. And then we will have the applicant respond to all questions at the end. If you'd like to come speak. You first, then you, ma'am. So I'm Dan Daly, 15 Corey Lane. Thank you for this hearing. We appreciate it. <clears throat> so my comment has to do with the character of the neighborhood, which we just heard about as well. So if you look at the if you look at the, the rendering there, mm -hmm. there's more space between our houses on Corey Lane and Pleasant Street than is in this proposal. What they're proposing is 10 feet, 11 feet off of the lot lines. The setbacks are literally uh, the, the 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 required setbacks and no more. The fact of the matter is, is that our homes on Quarry Lane and Pleasant Street go beyond the setbacks, and the houses are smaller. Now, I'm not opposed to this development. I think if it's done right, if it's done to fit the character of the neighborhood, and the gentleman just said something about fitting the character of the neighborhood with the 40-foot street, I agree. And I agree that they should fit the character of the neighborhood with the setbacks. For that reason, what I'm proposing is instead of three homes, one, two, three, lots one, two, and three, that there should only be two houses in that stretch. The density of the homes in that stretch is much greater than the density on Quarry Lane or, or Pleasant Street. The master plan, which recently came out, talked about preserving the character of the neighborhoods of Milton. And I think this is one of the opportunities that we have as a town to do that 
at this point. Again, I'm not opposed to the development. What I am opposed to is the density of the development, given that they are following the setbacks. Now, character is not about following the letter of the law. It's about, it's about fitting into the pre-existing neighborhood. If he wants to change the neighborhood, then this is the, this is the, the proposal that we ought to approve. But I don't think he does. I, I, I hope he doesn't. I hope he doesn't. He just said that he didn't want to. And we don't want our neighborhood to be changed. We're OK with the development. We are not OK with uh, the changing of the character of the neighborhood. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Ma'am, you're next. I'm Catherine Caswell, uh, Catherine Todd Caswell, 53 Pleasant Street. So I am one of the primary abutters. Um, we're basically going from having one house next door to having three um, along our property line. So of course, one of our primary concerns is screening. Um, right now, there isn't a lot of existing screening. There are a few mature trees, but not sufficient for having a neighbor now 20 feet away, as opposed to much further from, from before. Um, so we'd be looking to find out more about what the plan is for screening, um, maintaining mature trees, but also adding additional screening for privacy. Um, there's also a significant drop off from our property to number, is it 41? Number 41, um, which actually caused flooding in our basement uh, last fall. And so we would be looking to see what the plan is to address that um, and drainage. And also um, possibly depending on what the plan is for that first lot one, um, the retaining wall may be needed due to the severity of the drop off. Um, and then just general neighborhood concerns. Um, which we heard from some of the previous uh, discussions, dust control, fencing, noise, restrictions. Um, it's a very quiet neighborhood. Um, a lot of kids and a lot of pets out in the yards enjoying the quiet neighborhood. Um, and so obviously there will be a lot of construction over the course of probably two years, um, but we would want to try to limit that as much as we can and then another concern is the traffic, both due to the construction and then once all the construction's done, and we now have eight new properties. Uh, it's already a very busy street, um, especially during rush hour. Uh, just trying to pull out of our driveways on Pleasant Street to get to the at stop sign can be challenging as it is. Um, so adding a lot of other cars now coming out and making a turn onto our street, plus you have the incoming very fast traffic off Randolph Ave. Um, I have a lot of concerns about how that's going to affect us. Um, also, uh, during the school year, school buses park along our street as they wait to start their pickups. So um, there's already a lot of vehicles on the road. Um, and I think it would be an interesting discussion about possibly making Pleas that one part of Pleasant Street a dead end or s limited hours for cut through, but that might be a different discussion. Um, but that's it, so thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm Lisa Courtney from 59 Pleasant Street. Um, and I agree that there should be fewer homes constructed on this property, especially the, the first ones that Dan um, commented on. Um, our homes have become the foundation for great friendships, and we have no fences right now and plenty of open space for our kids to play. Um, and exactly as Dan said, this is the highest and best use of this property. We're not against the development. We just like it to look a little bit more like our neighborhood looks now and change it less. Um, and I think that the data of the plot plan sizes also supports that. If you look at the adjacent side of Pleasant Street and Quarry Lane, um, the average, even if you take out the two largest lots, which um, I believe are these two lots, which will be um, accumulated to put the eight houses, the average is almost 16,000. And then even if you look at the ones that are under 20,000, it's more like 12,000 instead of, I know that they're even above the 7,500 required square feet for um, a new home to be built. But I think bigger than that fits better with the character of the neighborhood as it is. Um, so I respectfully request that they reduce the number of homes being built. Um, with the few things that people have said this evening, Traffic pulling onto Pleasant Street is a concern of mine as well. I don't know anything really 40 foot versus 50 foot wide roads, but um, Pleasant Street gets busy enough to wake me up in the morning sometimes when the windows are open, um, especially the back, back probably 10 cars with, which would probably block 
the entrance to this roadway. Um, and drainage as well, we've been able to figure out how to keep our basement dry, but that's with uh, things as they are. And if we add more asphalt and blacktop, that could change and create a huge lake in my basement. So I'd like to avoid that too. So thank, thank you, you for having us all here. Anyone else? Yes, please come forward. Hi, Brian Wall from 56 Pleasant Street. And I'm one of those houses that the driver would come out facing at. I'm directly across the street yeah, as well. First, thank you for the opportunity and thank you all for the service to town. So as I mentioned, I'm at 56 Pleasant Street. Uh, I moved into that address 30 years ago. And when I did, you know, my wife and I raised three children there. Uh, we were one of many families with young families. We actually always considered that one-way section of Pleasant Street and Quarry Lane our neighborhood. Uh, and, and that's in effect what it became. Uh, over, I don't know what happened. I blinked my eyes and all of a sudden uh, we don't have the kids <laughs> and I'm the old man in the neighborhood. I remember being the young man in the neighborhood. I would say that it's been terrific to see the new neighbors with all the young children again. The sounds are great. Uh, the safety concerns are back, which, you know, I think we all ought to be cognizant of. There are a lot of young children on Quarry Lane and, and actually a lot of young families, uh, younger families moving in even to that one-way section of Pleasant Street. So it's funny, I, I just want to share a perspective to so take advantage, I guess more from my uh, neighbors, that when I first moved in, I got to know uh, Peg O'Neill pretty well. Peg O'Neill was the resident for many years at 41 Pleasant Street. And I knew Mrs. Murphy for a brief period of time, who's the other uh, woman, both terrific ladies. And I always remember Mrs. O'Neill telling me that, uh, well, a couple of things. I yelled at my daughter for going over and playing her yard and she yelled at me for yelling at her. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and she always opened up the yards and the yards were always like that. But I always remember her saying, hey look, when I pass, when I'm gone, this is going to be a, 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 a many residential houses put in this, this parcel. And so the current plan doesn't surprise me. I think with the character of Milton, we're a residential community, we are a bedroom community, it, it is one of the best uses of the property. But frankly, I actually made some changes to my property a few years ago because of a growing problem that most people in Milton are familiar with, but I got to tell you, it hits me right in the face, and that is the cut through traffic. The cut the, from, from 6.45 in the morning until 8.45 in the morning, it is very often bumper to bumper on my street, and it's always full of cars. I actually had to extend my driveway, and I put in a whole new section so that we, my wife and I could both, and, and my kids when they were there, uh, could, could actually pull into our driveway face for us. But before we backed out, turn around, because if we try to back out into that traffic in the morning, you know, it was like playing the lottery. And I usually lose when I play the lottery. Um, so it's, 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 it's horrendous. And in fact, that same traffic, I think most people are a lot more familiar with that same traffic when it returns, and what is it, by the way? It's mostly people that do not live in Milton. They're cutting through Milton to get to Boston, right? We know that. Why, they, why it's such a good idea for them to use a small, residential-only section of Pleasant Street when there's Randolph Ave, you know, that, that parallels it and has a beautiful trend around, is beyond me. However, I do, as a, as a kid, remember when Pleasant Street, that section that I live on, was a two-way. My mother's uh, sister, my aunt, lived up in Sassuan Ave, we would drive up Pleasant Street right past my property now, going the opposite way. We'd stop at Bent's at the end for some broken cookies and then we'd head up to Sassuan Ave. It was always challenging to try to leave that far end of Pleasant Street out onto Randolph Ave, heading towards Randolph, and guess what? Somebody said, you know, it's too challenging, let's make it a one way. Great step. Guess what, it's time to make it a dead end. It really is. Now, I don't know if you people are, you people, I apologize, the planning board. <laughs> it didn't sound good. This is a terrible, this is a terrible time for that kind of question. I don't know if the planning board, if that's within your purview, okay? But my perspective is let's start here. We're going to add a residential neighborhood. By the way, uh, Mr. Celebrity, I've attended both their meetings. They have been very forthcoming about what their plans are. Um, and I, I think that is a good use of the property. Um, but they're going to add eight more houses to try to empty out there, the little roulette as they, as they come out onto that section of Pleasant Street. 
I can tell you, everyone I've talked to would be fully supportive, including the, 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 the folks down at Benz. If we dead ended Pleasant Street just past Benz, right? And so that everybody in that neighborhood now enters from the Quarry Lane, Reedsdale Road end and leaves from that end, I don't think it would be detrimental to hardly any resident of Milton. It would be an annoyance to all the people that cut through Milton, and I hope it annoys them so much <laughs> that they don't come back in the evening on Randolph Ave and cause the horrendous traffic jam, I'm sure, Alex, you've seen it, living up on your end. Um, and I think it's a real time to consider that. You know, you're going to have, uh, that would probably ease some of the concerns of the angle of this road and, the, and the, the width of the road coming out onto Pleasant Street if, in fact, it's coming out onto a dead end. So, for whatever it's worth, um, I'm comfortable with the residential neighborhood going in there, but I do think it's time. And who's going to move in there? It's not going to be, you know, probably people like my wife and I have long after having uh, raised their families. It's going to be people either with a young family or planning to raise a young family there. More kids on a crazy street. Listen, I'll invite any one of you to come and have coffee with me from 6.45 to 8.45 if you want to see what it's like during the weekday. It's, it's crazy. So thank you for your time. Dead end Pleasant Street. <laughs> Thank any, you very any much. Other, uh, any other suggestions? Is the density okay with you? Uh, uh... Well, so, it, you know, it's interesting. I was listening. I, I'm very impressed with a lot of my new neighbors who I have not gotten an opportunity to know better. Um, and I understand and appreciate their concerns. Frankly, I was, I, I was probably bitten by the density uh, issue a lot more. When I moved in at 56 Pleasant Street, there was only one house between me and the corner, it was the, it was the house on the corner. And somehow overnight that turned into three lots and uh, you know, they, they barely meet the 7,500 square foot uh, requirement and they're really pork chop zoning. I mean, the, the, my, I can assure you the setbacks mild. My property is about 21,000 square feet. My next door neighbor in the newer lot that I'm speaking of is 7,500 square feet, and there's really not even 20 feet between our buildings, which is, I'm 10 feet from our property line, but they're not quite. Anyway, so the density, Alex, to answer your question, um, in, in terms of some of the concerns I think my neighbors raise, I can, I can uh, appreciate and understand. Um, it just, it doesn't hit me as, as much as the thought of the extra homes, the extra traffic, and the extra children. That'd be, that's my concern. I don't know if that answers you, but that's... And, and to your point, um, just to answer that, and then we'll just check in and see if there's anybody else who wants to speak before we turn it back to the applicant, but the planning board can't dead end it, but we could certainly talk to the traffic commission, um, I think, uh, and just see what they want to say. I, you know, I have to say that I... Hey, I'll talk I'm, to the traffic commission. Yeah, I'll well, talk see. To, I'll, I'll talk to whoever you recommend, and, yeah. I, and I would hope that this... Uh, the supporters of this development would, would also join us. I, I've got to imagine it would enhance this uh, development dramatically if that Well, I, I know, I mean, I'm very familiar with the areas, you know, I'm just around the, the corner and down a bit, but the angle that Pleasant Street intersects with Randolph Ave makes it very easy. Oh, you're coming up, look, the light's red. Right. And stopping for Bents, even in the middle of the day, I think the traffic actually gets faster. So it's oh, it does. Experience. Actually, you know, it's funny. You know, Rush hour slows it down. You know one of the safest times on Pleasant Street in the morning is Saturday mornings. And you know why? Because that's when cars park down at Bents on both right. sides, yep. but three or four or five long. And that's the only thing I've ever seen that slows that traffic down quite frankly. So if no at Dead End Street, then everybody should go to Benton's more often. So, <laughs> but it is, it is an important issue, and uh, yeah. thank, uh, you, and, thank and you to all of you who have brought that up. So, um, and great. listen, people have been wanting to start reversing this horrendous cut-through traffic problem in Milton. This is the opportunity for the first step. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank Does you. anybody else wish to speak? If not, why don't you two come back up and, and address anything that you'd like, and then we'll talk about our next steps. I think you've heard a, a number of concerns. Yes, thank you. Uh, on the, the first concerns about the uh, size of the lot, 
and the density. I mean, it meets zoning. If you, if you look at the first three lots on Quarry Lane, uh, coming up on the right side, they're very similar to the, the two lots there. They might even be a little smaller. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I don't think they're out of proportion to what's on Quarry Lane. And you know, I, I know that uh, Mr. Walsh's lots are 20,000 square feet. There are other lots on the other side that are in the 7,500, 8,000, 9,000 square foot range. So, um, and then as far as uh, uh, you know, the, the footprint of these homes, I know they're close to the lot line right now, but they, we just took a footprint and put it on the, on the buildings, uh, on the lots, just to project some type of footprint for a house. It doesn't mean they're all gonna be the same width as this house. This is probably a little wider than some of them will be. Um, that might be helpful in the, in the um, final application to indicate what size of house or what footprint of house you're... Sure, show more think. variety maybe than, yeah. than we're showing right now. Uh, you know, regarding the dead end issue, I, you know, I don't think we have any problem with that issue. Uh, even a restriction in the morning from seven to nine or something that uh, no right turn off Randolph would be uh, helpful. That seems to be the worst part of the day. Um, the, uh, as far as the, the, during construction, you know, we plan on submitting a construction plan, management plan, and uh, you know, address all the issues that we heard earlier tonight basically, so, uh, um, and then the lots themselves, uh, we, we think they're fairly decent sized lots and, uh, you know, and they think they've, they fit into the neighborhood. Some of the lots in the neighborhood are larger, some of them are smaller. So it's, it's the, kind of in the middle of it. Yes, you had a question. Uh, well, just uh, thinking about that question of the size of the house on the lot, I mean, there is a zoning requirement for what size house you can put on the lot based on the size of the lot. Yes. So for their neighbors, um, in respect to what they've said, maybe you could provide that to us on the plan. That, the calculation. The sure. calculation for each one of these. And then also put the setback lines on yes. so that the, you can have the buildable portion yeah. of the lot visible. I think that would help people. That, that's good. We've requested that before. Yeah. So what's your timeline, Paul? Uh, I'm, just gonna be I'm this not yeah. totally familiar with the preliminary process. Do you do want to continue through the preliminary or did you, uh, you refer us to submit a definitive? Or? Well, it's entirely up to you. If you want to continue it to another meeting and come back with some revisions before you uh, do the definitive, I think we're probably fine with doing that. Um, if you think you've got enough to submit a definitive, understanding obviously that that's also going through a public hearing process, um, that would also be fine unless I hear any objections. You know, you may want to refine it a little bit further before you do the definitive. Sure. I think that's up to you. I mean, obviously, when you get to the definitive, we may have, we'll have more specific questions based on what you submit to us. So, right. um, also, if you wanted to continue it and have another round of discussion with the neighbors, I mean, I think we'd be open to that. So, just to get a sense of what you'd like to do, Alex. What do you well, the purpose of the preliminary plan is to see if there are any issues, and here there is an issue and the issue is whether or not this new street should intersect pleasant street at 90 degrees and that's what the rules and regulations require and that's what you've got to do unless you can show that what you have here has a desirable benefit on the neighborhood um, and you're going to probably not want us to take a vote on this plan, even though whatever we vote wouldn't be uh, uh, wouldn't be binding. It would be just it would be just showing what we think. But what you want to do is come to us with a plan showing that you got a good development that the neighborhood can support, and therefore you should get your requested waivers, because the waivers really are dependent 
on showing that this, there's a good public purpose for the waiver. Uh, so, uh, my suggestion for is to continue this, uh, continue this public hearing and uh, um, see what you can, uh, what you can do. I think to that point, and certainly to the discussion of how the two roads are intersecting with each other, you will probably want to have somebody look at the sight lines. So you can't assume that a dead end would happen or that it would happen, quick, happen quickly, and you do have a serious issue with traffic flying down. So if the sight lines aren't good enough to deal with that, you've got a problem in, in requesting your waiver. So I think you should have a look at that. See what that does when uh, people are flying down that road and somebody's trying to eat nose in or nose out of that your your sure. road. So I think that uh, you probably want to be, stay on. It would be on the twenty third. We would know. be if you think you can get information to us by next Thursday. If you want to more relax, you could either have the late. It would be late on the twenty third because we're giving Thayer two full hours. I mean, not the twenty third. Late on the thirteenth or you go for the second meeting in August. So um, it's up to you. We just ask that we get any materials next Thursday. So the meeting's next? Meeting's uh, two weeks from today, but we need the Start materials meeting. a week beforehand. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Okay. All right, so let's so see. We have 7.15 with 7.30. 7.15, Brush Hill. 7.30 is the start of the deliberations on 865. Um, we're also going to, there's the 11 Bryant Ave site plan approval yep. that I am writing up. I don't know how long <coughs> that'll take you all to deliberate, but okay. I was thinking that that could be done at this meeting also. So why don't we put them on for 8 o'clock and then we can do Bryant Avenue for, say, 830. That should be about right. And then we'll have the public forum discussion after that. And we'll be good to go. Great. Work for you guys? Thank you. Okay, Thank you. excellent. Good night. Thank you very much. So I would say that the hour is late. Um, I'll have some, uh, a draft of the um, public forum and sort of what I'm hoping each person will take on for discussion in our next meeting. I'll provide it to you that week before. And so I would accept a motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Bye. Thank bye. you, Brian.